until you're speaking, uh, please uh, remain muted. Okay. Well, okay, I'll mute myself. <laughs> Well, that's after we begin. Well, I meant remain muted after we start. So it's okay. To... Well, I enjoyed uh, Paul's presentation on SLU. Yeah. Yeah. That was really good. And I have to admit that uh, the whole time we were at Alcon last night, I was observing uh, Jupiter. Uh, had a different screen open. Kind of learned to pronounce your first name the way he does. I kind of like it. Well, culturally, <laughs> I notice, of course, I'm in Florida and a lot of Caribbeans are around. They always put the accent on the second syllable. Bernard. Uh -huh. Bernard. And I think the UK does as well. But I'm accustomed to it. Uh, of course, Pittendre has uh, 17 varieties. Of <laughs> That's never mispronounced, is it, by anyone? Oh, very seldom. <laughs> all the time, all the time. But I would recommend SLU, at least give it a try for a few months. Uh, I've been very pleased with it. I've been with it since 2004. Yeah, I'm a little concerned about it from the standpoint of the observing programs, because some of them do re allow remote telescopes, but you have to be the one submitting the request for the campaign. You cannot just join one. Yeah, I, I, I made that point, Aaron, uh, that um, you have to look at uh, each observing program to see if they allow remote telescopes and whether it's device uh, aided, um, but also uh, you have it can you can't, what I call looking over the shoulder of someone else. It's gotta be your mission. You've got to input the coordinates. Um, yep. And so, uh, uh, of course, with all the programs, it's a level of trust, but you're absolutely right. Um, it, it's gotta be your mission. And part of the fun okay. is putting the, the coordinates and, and making sure you get out. I'm absolutely right. <laughs> I've looked at some things and I thought, man, this is nowhere near where I should have been. It's always my mistake. Does it not locate objects? You have to just input coordinates? Well, I always input the coordinates because I look at unusual things. Uh, and I think in order to, to be a true observer, that's what you, you need. Sure, to, sure. Yeah. But uh, as Paul was saying, there are easier ways to do it, especially for a beginner. But I think uh, <clears throat> the folks in this room right now would always prefer to input their own coordinates and camera settings and things like that. Um, but with, there are lots of different online choices and uh, some of them are just friends. I've got three or four friends who have remote telescopes that they allow me to use. I think it's amazing all the educational things that you can do with that to get people started to help kids along and parents. Yeah.
Hi, Scott. Hello, Scott. Hello. We see you, Scott. You were staring <laughs> off into the distance. <laughs> Daydreaming. Uh, Full well, screen. I was thinking about the star party. <laughs> well, this this is what astronomers do. We stare off. <laughs> it, is. Space. it is. Well, uh, we're back. <laughs> so, yeah. I say. <laughs> so uh, we we had a great first session uh, uh, this afternoon, and uh, you know the fun's not over. Um, so uh, <laughs> all he's looking at lots of laughs. Scott's face. Okay, my my face is almost as red as this shirt right now. So anyhow, um, glad you guys are enjoying it. Uh, so many nice comments. Uh, I hope you're all learning. Um, you know, something new, uh, something fascinating, and something that deepens your appreciation of astronomy. Um, you know, the Astronomical League uh, officers put in a lot of work into this. If you're not already uh, a league member, you know, consider joining. Uh, if you're somewhere else in the world, you can join as a member at large. Um, and uh, if you are in the United States, uh, you can certainly join one of the league clubs that would automatically make you a member. Uh, but otherwise, you know, join because this is a great volunteer organization now in its 75th year. So you definitely want to take advantages, advantage of all the resources that the Astronomical League has to offer. And it's it's a lot. So I'll turn it over to you and, and uh, to Terry and to Chuck. OK, uh, thank, thank you, Scott. Uh, the uh, program we have for session seven. Uh, for the next uh, hour and a half will uh, consist of the award of our uh, 2020 Astronomical League Award, which, uh, as I said earlier, is the highest award given by the Astronomical League, and also our second place 2021 National Young Astronomer Award and our second place Mabel Stearns Award for 2021. We'll then have a talk by David Dunham, and then we'll give away $600 in door prizes to conclude the session. So with that, uh, I'll turn the program over to the president of the Astronomical League, Carol Orge. Thank you, Chuck. Over the years, uh, the Astronomical League Award has been given to lots of uh, worthy people who have put in a lot of work for the league. Unfortunately, last year, we weren't able to give it live. So uh, like a lot of, of awards we've done so far, we're doing it this way. The Astronomical League is presented to a person who has gone well beyond what is expected for many, many years. And this, the year for 2020, is no exception. And we'll say more about it in just a little bit, but I would like to present now the 2020 Astronom Astronomical League Award to Hold on just a second. <laughs> He's got the plaque, Carol. Okay, good deal. <laughs> we pulled it off, Kent. <laughs> <laughs> Very deserving to Scott. Uh, we wanted to uh, hide it from uh, Kent and or from Scott. Uh, Kent hit it so well that we had to do some last minute maneuvering, but that's okay. <laughs> Scott, you've been a real inspiration to all of us at the Astronomical League for the last probably 20, 25 years, starting with your mead days when you were the one who started sponsoring the NYAA and just gave it everything. From there on, you've been involved in so many activities, uh, current sponsorships included. And we just want to thank you so much for everything you have done. You've made such a difference in uh, lots of people's lives and the lots of lives of uh, Astronomical League members. And if, before you speak, uh, Scott, I want to chime in as the person who got Naya rolling and you came to the rescue immediately with those wonderful telescope prizes from Mead. And then uh, since then, uh, sponsoring it through Explore Scientific. And I can't tell you 
uh, that anything has made this program more successful for the last 30 years than your actions in support of it and your support of our virtual convention and so many other activities. Uh, thank you so much. And I would now like to uh, turn the mic over to Ron Kramer, who was president during last year. I believe Ron's got a couple of words to say. Are you there, Ron? Maybe not. Well, we'll catch his comments a little bit later if he uh, comes unmuted there. Uh, again, Scott, well done. And uh, thank you so much for all you do. Okay, I, I want to thank everybody at the league. I, I muted myself again, so. <laughs> <laughs> you can fool us. We don't see it. <laughs> You should have just let me continue to stare off into space, you know. Well, I'm, I'm sure it was a pretty good speech. So go ahead, Carol. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm flabbergasted, really. And I, I, I just, you know, the thing is, is I feel that the league uh, is, is really one of the very, very best organizations for amateur astronomers. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, camaraderie that happens within the organization, all the education, the sustainable nature of the organization. It's, again, it's 75 years old. It's a volunteer program. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of volunteerism that goes on. Uh, maybe you see groups together for you know, five years or good Lord, maybe 10 years. A rock band might last 10 years or something with few exceptions, you know, that, that's, that's uh, about right. But, uh, you know, this rock band, the Astronomical League, you know, these rock stars, uh, you know, have uh, done this for a good portion of their lives. And, um, you know, they inspire other people to be involved for over the long term. So, you know, I still feel like, um, you know, that I really haven't done very much uh, for the Astronomical League. It's been a lot of fun uh, through the years, and it's been wonderful. Uh, you know, for the awards we've underwritten, uh, for the National Young Astronomers Award and the Leslie Peltier Award, and now some of these uh, astrophotography things that we're looking at, um, I just see it as uh, a privilege, you know, to somehow be involved. So we thank sure you. appreciate it. You're always on the cutting edge of everything, and we learned so much being around you. Thank you and, very much. And, and Scott, you're on a list with people like Armin Spitz. And Harlow Shapley and oh, geez. Grace Spitz, Margaret Mayall, Norman Edmond, Leslie Peltier, uh, Walter oh, Scott man. Houston, uh, Dr. Dunham, who will be speaking here shortly, Claude Tombaugh is a winner, uh, and so many other uh, great. I'm getting dizzy stars. now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're in uh, thin air, yeah, very, it's very it's high atmosphere. Wow. Thank hey, you. Thank sure. you so much. Now back to uh, Chuck, I believe. Yes, thank you. We have a couple of awards to present now, and uh, I would like to ask if Taryn Kota is with us. Yep. Are you there? Yep. Okay, hello. Good to see Hi. you. Am yep. I pronouncing your name correctly? Yep, uh, it's Tarun, so it kind of rhymes with broom. Tarun Kota, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Tarun's uh, project this year won second place in the National Young Astronomer Award competition, which is high honors considering the quality of the projects that we saw. Uh, he is a, I believe you're a rising senior, is yep. that correct, at ECU High School in Apple Valley, Minnesota. Um, he's co-founder of the Student Astrophysics Society, which is comprised of high school and undergraduate members from some 15 countries, perhaps more by now. And he organizes uh, monthly lectures uh, by astrophysicists, and he also conducts the astrophysics book club meetings, uh, high level stuff. Uh, he runs a Discord server where members can chat about the latest space news and events. He developed a research mentorship program where members can conduct research pro uh, projects with mentor astrophysicists, and recently. Uh, wrote an introduction to an astrophysics books, book for elementary students called The ABCs of Astrophysics. He's currently working on formatting and doing illustrations for the book. <clears throat> uh, his research project, <clears throat> excuse me, arose from his work at Caltech's 
uh, Infrared Processing Analysis Center, or IPAC. Uh, and I, rather than me describing it, Turing, would you tell us about your project a little bit? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I'm, I'm honored to uh, receive this award. It's really incredible that you're really fostering like high school research. Because that's not really a common thing, it's, it's especially in astronomy, where a, a lot of it's for, you know, grad students or postdocs and so on. So I'm really grateful that you've given high schoolers like me the opportunity to be a recognized for the research. Um, in, in terms of my research, really what I was trying to find was brown dwarfs, which are arbitrarily failed stars or stars that have some planet-like properties. And the reason that we, we, that we, that we, that we want to find uh, brown dwarfs is because they're really critical in finishing our census of, of the solar neighborhood. Because right now, most of the objects that we're missing right now in our solar neighborhood, which is around like, like 20 parsecs away from the sun, is the very cool brown dwarfs or, or like the wide dwarfs per se. As well as um, it's really critical in finding like the like the a low mass a cutoff of star formation because if you can find really really cold dwarfs you can figure out what's like the coldest uh, an object so uh, what's the smallest an object can be uh, to form a star. So essentially, I used a, like a, a database called Catwise twenty twenty and I essentially built a supervised machine learning method to filter out candidates through Catwise twenty twenty. And bring out candidates that fit our criteria, and then after that, I went through those candidates through various like analysis methods. For example, using a color color diagram, or using other databases to essentially filter out um, new discoveries. So over overall, we found around twenty five to thirty objects, and the most interesting ones were uh, two nearby M dwarfs, uh, possibly a young L dwarf, and uh, and in high motion the T two dwarf, but whether like a with a, with a velocity of around 280 kilometers per second. And, and in the future, uh, we're just trying to find more objects and continue to use the methods that, that we've uh, developed and hopefully find uh, e even more brown dwarfs in the future. Fantastic. Uh, you're gonna pursue a career in astrophysics? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I have, I think I'm interested in also like the research part of it. So like, um, like stars and planets and stuff, as well as, as you mentioned in the, in the intro, I'm also really, really interested in like the education part of astronomy, which is why this is really cool that you're fostering like astronomy education and involvement in astronomy. And that's not something that I hope to do in the future, whether that's like through policy or like through organizations and whatnot. You have your plaque handy. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Very good. Fantastic. Well, we're really, uh, we're really proud to have young folks like you involved in our program. It, it really adds so much to have the quality submissions that we had, especially this year it was, and last year too. It was just fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us and congratulations again. And good luck your senior year. Yeah, I thank you for inviting okay. me and giving me the award. Okay. I really appreciate it. Take care. You too. Uh, okay, Andrea Cool, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hi, Andrea. Good to see you. Uh, Good to Andrea, see you. am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Is it cool? Cool. Cool. I'm Good. Cool. Okay. If I don't ask, I'll get it wrong. Uh, Andrea is the newsletter editor of the San Diego Astronomical Association, and she has put together a really beautiful newsletter featuring observing guides and office and committee rosters, workshop information. Uh, calendars, articles, and member astrophotos as well. Uh, the, one of the more recent issues in June uh, featured 12 pages of articles, images, and information about club activities and astronomical events. And uh, she's uh, received recognition as the runner-up in our 2021 Mabel Stearns uh, competition. Andrea, I hope you'll I hope you'll compete next year as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to say about your club or your activities or your newsletter? Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm very grateful and I'm very happy to be doing the newsletter for the San Diego Astronomy Association. It's a, uh, one of the largest astronomy clubs in the United States. And we do uh, an, an awful lot of educational outreach. That's our main function. 
and we've been doing the best we can with the restrictions imposed right now, but we're getting up going again. And it's just a great club. And I'm just very happy to, uh, to help with the newsletter. I've well, the, the newsletter, as I've told people before, is the way that clubs communicate among themselves, the way you communicate with your members. And it's an absolutely vital link. And so we really appreciate what you do for your club and uh, what your club does for the league. So thank you so much for joining us and congratulations again. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Okay, uh, Terry, I believe we have a speaker coming up. I'll turn it over to you. You're muted. Thank you, Chuck. Our next speaker coming up is Dr. David Dunham. Uh, Dr. Dunham is a trajectory design engineer at Kenex Aerospace. He got his PhD in celestial mechanics from Yale University in 1971. He played major roles in the trajectory design for pioneering mission, missions including IC3 and the first Liberation Point mission and the first to go to a comet, near orbiting and landing on Eros and Stereo. He also worked on Messenger, NASA Mercury Orbiter, and New Horizon for the Pluto flyby. He established the Lunar Grazing Occultation Program in the 1960s and co-founded the International Occultation Timing Association in 1975. This is an organization that mainly observes occultations of stars by asteroids to determine their size and shapes. He was the first to obtain coordinated video observations of lunar impact flashes in 1999 and to record an occultation by a small near-Earth asteroid, Apopolis, in 2021. So, Dr. Dunham, are you ready? Yes, I am. All right, welcome. Okay, I'll hit my share screen and see if we can get going here. Okay. Wait, share right there. Okay. And all I have to do is hit, um, come on, where's the, darn, the controls are, uh, <laughs> I have to pull this. Where can I, wait. You're looking for the share screen button? No, no, I've got the share screen button, and um, I. Uh, but um, um, the problem is um, the control to it. switch to full screen on my or to slideshow on my uh, uh, PowerPoint is. Uh, okay. Let's see. Okay, where? Okay, let, let me get here. And now, if I could just move this around a little bit underneath the controls. <laughs> um, if you just go straight into uh, presentation mode, it should give you. Yeah, yeah. But the problem is the presentation controls are under a, a thing at the top that says chat, oh, new, share, all the Zoom the stuff. Okay. We see your whole thing. Uh, <laughs> OK, let's. Um, let's oh, gosh. Um, I can, uh, I can, I know how to do slideshow? it. Don't you hit slideshow? Slideshow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can get it now. I had to pull the screen down a little bit, and now I hit the slideshow. Come on. Um, oh, Again. Hit yeah, yeah, from beginning there. That's what I have to do. Okay, now I think I've got it. Um, um, okay, let's see if I can. Uh, <clears throat> um, it's cutting off stuff at the side and the top. There's a way of minimizing the. We, uh, we don't see that. We okay. Don't see that. We see the whole slide. Okay, you see the um, near uh, Earth asteroid occultations adopted in the paper number, and we see the logos at the bottom. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, so, so we're ready. Um, so this is a, a talk, uh, similar talk I gave at the Planetary Defense Conference that was held online in April, um, but I've expanded it a bit to. Um, um, I only had, uh, you know, t 10 minutes for that one. So <laughs> I've expanded this to um, cover the hour here um, to talk about this very interesting new activity that IOTA is um, 
uh, started uh, actually in 2019. Um, so anyway, the, um, let's see, there's one more thing. Okay. Um, yeah, the, um, anyway, um, in, um, you know, of course, 65 million years ago, um, over 70% of plant and animal species uh, perished in a, uh, uh, when a 10 kilometer asteroid uh, struck the Yucatan. Um, so uh, worldwide fires and so forth, the dinosaurs died and now humans rule because the dinosaurs had no space program and no planetary defense. So um, this shows the, uh, um, the cumulative, um, um, the, the um, show shows the, you know, cumulative uh, impact shows the number of uh, asteroids that have been discovered. This is as of 2012, but it's only crept up a little bit since then as the red line um, in uh, terms of the size of the asteroids. Um, and, um, you know, this gives a bunch of statistics here. Here's the diameter. Um, but um, you see that, um, you know, all the asteroids, um, I mean, in this, the, the dotted line is the expected population of the asteroids. And you can see all of them had, had, uh, down to about a kilometer in diameter have been discovered pretty much. But starting, uh, um, you know, going to the smaller asteroids to, um, you know, to the ones like the Tunguska event, uh, um, which devastated a huge section of forest in Siberia and, um, 1908, um, uh, there are, uh, you know, over, over, you know, more than a two orders of magnitude. So, you know, more than a few hundred asteroids that have not been discovered at least. And, um, and there are thousands in the range up to about 140 meters, which can still wipe out most of a state. Uh, so anyway, so we're trying to find as many of these asteroids as we can. And once they're found, though, we need to get precise orbits in order to predict the future impacts, possible future impacts of the, by the asteroid far into the future. So that's where um, we're coming in. Um, I'm talking about, uh, I'll give some introduction to IOTA and asteroid occultations and a bit of the history. I'll talk about uh, an early NEA occultation. Um, then occultations by the asteroid Phaethon, which we observed in 2019, um, and uh, then occultations by Apophis, and um, then I'll go some, some predictions of upcoming events, and I'll give some quick information about how to observe in time and record occultations. And uh, at the end, I'll give some additional resources. Um, anyway, the... Um, observer network that became IOTA uh, started to form in the 1960s to observe lunar grazing occultations with mobile efforts. Um, the mobile techniques to observe lunar grazing occultations were uh, used effectively to observe asteroid occultations starting in the 1970s, uh, late 1970s. Um, then uh, in the 1980s, IOTA began recording occultations with the video equipment and much improving the observations. Uh, so working with the NASA small bodies node in the Minor Planet Center, IOTA archives all asteroidal occultation observations that uh, we collect worldwide. Um, and um, ESA's Hipparchus and Gaia missions have greatly improved the prediction accuracy, resulting in a large increase in the number of observed occultations. The sizes, shapes, and accurate positions of hundreds of asteroids have been determined. Dozens of close double stars have determined, I'll go on. Um, anyway, uh, this shows the general orbit uh, or, or general geometry of a occ lunar occultation. As the moon moves in its orbit around the earth, it casts a shadow of its, 
uh, cast by a star at an infinite distance to essentially infinite distance to the upper left, I mean, hundreds of light years or thousands of light years. Um, but um, it's essentially a cylindrical shadow that intercepts the Earth's surface. And then as the moon moves, it sweeps out a path, a region of visibility. And um, you have uh, um, an occultation within this uh, wide zone. Uh, but if you're right at the northern or southern limits of the occultation, the star is a path uh, tangent to uh, follows a path tangent to the moon's disk and uh, the star will disappear and reappear in a grazing occultation and if you're outside the path you have a miss but anyway this shows an example of a good example of a lunar graze that um, we observe where we plot the distances of the observers from the predicted limit and their times relative to the time of central graze um, the, hear a little bit of clicking in the back. Is everyone else muted? There. Or am I doing it? I don't know. Okay. And anyway, um, I think I'm doing it. I wonder if uh, I should... Scott, you aren't muted, Scott. Scott, can you mute everybody except Dr. Dunham? There, I, I think, I think, okay, it's, I don't hear anyone else now. Can you hear me? Oh, I, I was muted too. I didn't realize it. I uh -huh. am muted. You just don't see it on this. Okay, okay, good. Well, well, all gone. Anyway, um, the large expeditions we had like this inspired a generation of young amateur astronomers around the time of the Apollo missions. And I point out this one really excellent video of a grazing occultation um, that uh, you're encouraged to look at. Uh, anyway, this just shows a, a bunch of us uh, observe on one of these expeditions where we built some specialized equipment to record them, these big cable systems, uh, uh, because not everyone had the timing equipment uh, uh, to uh, time the occultations. Uh, this shows one result showing the, uh, the, the dots or the observed contacts um, during a graze uh, that was uh, uh, relative to uh, Watt's lunar profile, which is the this, this smooth curve here, the predicted profile of the moon. You can see the, the general shape uh, agrees, but, um, but there, the details uh, obviously are, um, uh, um, do not match the profile uh, really well. But um, uh, starting with the uh, Kaguya mission and more recently the Lunar Orbiter, um, NASA's uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, we've got much more precise information from laser ranging uh, observations of the moon's surface from low lunar orbit. You can see now the observed points from that same graze line up with the, uh, LR, the uh, Kaguya profile very well. And uh, anyway, the geometry for an asteroid occultation is very similar. Uh, in this case, the asteroid is uh, around two or three astronomical units away, but it still casts a shadow of the star and observers set up across the predicted path. And then um, they make timings and define the um, you know, uh, lines behind the asteroids. And you have to set up a little bit wider than the predicted path because there's uncertainty in the predictions. And anyway, though, the bottom line is that the more stations that can be deployed, the better the resolution of the asteroid shape you can get from the occultations. And this just shows uh, one very good example of an occultation by the uh, asteroid Antiope that was observed in 2011. Um, and uh, uh, so, um, Anyway, occultations provide excuses for travel, or you can just observe them from home to further astronomical knowledge. Uh, some use made use especially made easily transportable telescopes. There is room for innovation and in design and construction of equipment and software to record asteroid occultations. And this just gives a quick rundown on uh, how we actually run remote stations for asteroid occultations using video recorders and uh, scheduled timers and so forth. Um, we use uh, 
computer, you know, small PCs now that can um, um, be programmed to time to record um, in advance. But the whole idea is you point a telescope beforehand to the same altitude and azimuth that the target star will have at the time of the occultation and keep it fixed in that direction. And then the Earth's rotation will bring it into the field of view at the right time. It's a very robust. The Earth's rotation is much better than any telescope drive. And um, we've succeeded in setting up um, you know, many uh, you know, dozens of stations uh, um, this way that automatically record the occultation just by you know, one observer or two observers can deploy the equipment. Um, but um, the idea is uh, you can draw a line on a star chart, the so, so-called pre-point line, um, and um, uh, you point your telescope at one of these stars that's very close to that line at the right time, at the time given on the chart, and then uh, it will be lined up in the right direction to record the occultation. Um, this just shows some quick results showing how um, occultations are used to um, um, resolve uh, differences in shape models um, for um, um, for the occultation. You can see shape model one um, and shape model two. Model two fits the observations much better than model one, so um, we can uh, rule out shape model one in this case. Um, the shape models are derived from um, light curve observations uh, of the rotational light curves of the asteroids. And uh, there's usually some ambiguity um, depending upon which way the pole is pointed as to whether the asteroid is one shape or another. Um, anyway, we've also discovered a lot of close double stars with uh, asteroidal occultations. This just shows one example by the asteroid Una, an eighth magnitude star that had a 10th magnitude companion. Um, but um, um, an interesting uh, observation is the discovery of satellites of asteroids. In fact, we had the first evidence back from the 1970s. We claim that we saw secondary occultations of stars by asteroids. And um, um, we tried to convince the scientific community. But of course, in those days, the observations were all visual and, and they laughed us out of the <laughs> court. And they said, no, asteroids can't have satellites. And of course, and um, with the Galileo flyby of um, 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 asteroid Ida, um, we, uh, it was shown that, yes, asteroids do have uh, satellites. Um, and, you know, many hundreds of asteroids have been have found the duplicity has been found from light curve observations and some from occultations. This was an especially good recent um, asteroid occultation discovery. Um, the discovery was made by Peter Nusworthy and Dave Galt. Uh, it's the asteroid 4337 Arecibo. Um, on May 19th this year, um, these two observers set up in their observatories in the um, Blue Mountains uh, west of Sydney, Australia, and just they just try to observe every occultation they can, but just from their fixed sites usually, and um, and their uh, observations are these uh, slanted ones here. Um, they got the main occultation, but then three seconds later they had a short occultation by the uh, by by a moon of the asteroid and the fact that the, both observers observed it we got confirming observations of that event um, so so we said okay we've got a really strong um, um, detection here um, but then it turned out uh, less than a month later there was an occultation i mean the star was only 13.6 magnitude but they had good equipment and were able to get good recordings and um, showed that uh, um, um, that this was the case. And uh, there's a YouTube uh, uh, um, a link here uh, that uh, you know gives a good account of this event. Um, but uh, anyway, on June 9th, there was an occultation of a 12th magnitude star um, in central California. And so I noted um, a team uh, Richard Nolthenius and Kirk Bender, who lived in Santa Cruz. And uh, they said, OK, we'll try that event. Uh, and they drove down about 100 miles uh, south into the uh, Salinas Valley. 
and um, separated a bit farther this time. And they also recorded both occultations by Arecibo and by the moon. Uh, so, um, and so this time we were able to tell that the moon is really quite large. It's about 13 kilometers across, um, whereas, uh, and the, whereas the main asteroid is about 24 kilometers. So it's a very sizable object. Um, so we're trying to get uh, future observations of this. And the next occultation that we have is a 13.6 magnitude star um, whose path crosses central Florida um, on the uh, evening of uh, September 3rd. So we hope some observers down there can try that. Um, occultations by ARC were not very rare. I checked uh, 2022, uh, you know, for next year, there really are no good events in North America um, for this asteroid. Um, but also rings have been discovered uh, by some objects. This shows one example, and um, especially um, the professionals are especially interested in occultations by Trojan asteroids and centaurs. Uh, so those are some of the most valuable events and um, 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 organized by the Lucky Star program out of Paris Observatory and the Southwest Research Institute's recon network in the Western US. Um, the first uh, near-Earth asteroid occultations was an occultation um, of Kappa Geminorum by Eros observed in New England in January 24th, 1975. It was the first occultation by actually any asteroid that was observed from multiple stations, um, especially the stations deployed by the Pioneer Valley Colleges. It was the first successful coordinated effort to observe such an event by mobile observers. Um, but unfortunately, a crucial observation now known to be false negative resulted in the wrong squash shape of the asteroid shown here. But you can see their observations fit the arrow's shape model determined from the uh, near-Earth asteroid rendezvous mission um, uh, quite well. Um, Anyway, next I'll talk about Phaethon, which the first asteroid was discovered by a spacecraft. It's the parent body of the Geminid meteor streams. <laughs> and uh, the uh, you know, Phaethon uh, has a perihelion of only 0.14 AU, uh, so less, quite less than Mercury. So it has extreme thermal changes. It goes out to over 2 AU into the main asteroid belt at aphelion. Um, so anyway, small non-gravitational forces on its orbit have been detected. Um, the, uh, um, in 2025, the Japanese uh, Space Agency hopes to send a small spacecraft to uh, fly by Phaethon and image it. Um, radar observations show that Phaethon is nearly spherical with a diameter of almost six kilometers. Um, anyway, um, in January 2019, an occultation was found by an amateur observer in Japan, an occultation of a seventh magnitude star by, um, by uh, Phaethon. And uh, we were very nervous about this in IOTA, trying to observe an occultation by an only five kilometer asteroid. All the uh, smallest asteroids we had actually successfully observed before that were around 35, 40 kilometers in diameter. Um, so, but um, uh, professional astronomers were very interested in this event and asked IOTA and NASA to try to get observations of it. Um, so this was the smallest objects I said that we'd ever tried and um, um, a number of uh, challenges uh, were made uh, to the software because of this event. And um, but finally, a pretty good prediction we thought was made by um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, showing uh, how the error lips um, with observations, um, uh, especially using Gaia data, was key to uh, collapsing the error lips uh, to a smaller value. But um, but we weren't sure uh, the um, errors of the asteroid. The three sigma errors was uh, you know about. 20 miles wide or so, but we tried to cover about a 60-mile um, wide 
zone um, with uh, up to 70 stations, uh, which we planned, but um, it turned out we actually got um, 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 eight lines were occupied by um, people from the Southwest Research Institute with their six large 16 inch telescopes in Colorado, whereas IOTA observers uh, covered um, the other 58 lines, many traveling great distances at their own expense. Um, and some observers ran up to nine pre-pointed remote stations. So this, uh, this just shows the overall plan and uh, shows a couple of the observers, but um, most of these lines were all occupied. Um, this just shows one of the observations uh, that people who um, confirm the Arecibo event, they also um, observed this event and um, they were part of that network and Richard Nolthenius success actually observed an occultation lasting only half a second by faith on um, and you can see the light curve occultation light curve he got. Um, this is a plot of all of those observers, uh, the paths of all the successful observers, um, and just uh, six of them who were um, near the center line actually observed the occultation. And uh, you'll notice the lines are not evenly spaced like they were on the map. And that's because um, a lot of the people, even the professionals, didn't realize that you have to correct for height above sea level when you're dealing with this accuracy when trying to space observers only uh, a kilometer apart. And actually two of the lines, one of the observers in Colorado um, landed right on top of another observer who was near uh, Las Vegas <laughs> as a result of uh, not taking into account that height above sea level. Uh, but um, uh, but even so, we got a pretty good uh, distribution, and, um, and now we um, everyone realizes you have to correct for height above sea level, just like we're, we're doing all the time for lunar grazing occultations. Um, anyway, this just shows a blow up of the shape model determined from radar fitted to the occultation observations. See, there's good agreement, and we got a very strong astrometric point from this observation. But now the question is, you got one point, but then you have to get another one to really pin down the orbit. Um, and uh, so, uh, um, so we uh, tried, it turned out uh, two months later, there was an occultation of a 12th magnitude star and seventh, instead of seventh magnitude. So we tried to set up um, uh, observations in the desert in California where this path went. And, um, the, on the lower right shows the successful observations. It was, um, we had 10 inch telescopes, uh, two pre-pointed 10 inch telescopes at stations AO4 and AO5, which got the southern edge of the uh, object and then a more central cord and AO7, uh, just a little bit uh, farther south in our uh, coverage had a miss. Um, but there were two other observations farther north that had problems with their timings, but they did detect the occultation, but the actual um, uh, details were unknown. So this wasn't good enough to get a shape model or anything of it, uh, but it did give a good astrometric point, which uh, allowed us defining the orbit really well uh, to predict uh, um, a series of occultations that occurred the next month during October. We got these uh, uh, four different occultations. The predicted duration of all of these was only three tenths of a second. So uh, in one case, they actually deployed a one meter portable telescope um, in France and uh, got a nice recording of that event. Um, but um, in another case, um, um, Dejanai Baba Assisa, uh, um, it was an observer in Algiers and um, two of the past crossed Algeria and he actually observed both of those events. So he's the first person in the world to observe two near Earth asteroid occultations actually by the same object. So he's all interested in that. Um, anyway, we didn't have any more observations until a year later in uh, 2020 October when R Roger Venable um, deployed uh, to, to uh, uh, four telescopes in Mississippi, and uh, he, uh, one of them detected the occultation, uh, so giving us another uh, uh, point. 
So altogether, these have been used to determine the uh, um, A2 um, non-gravitational parameter of phaethon. Um, and um, the, uh, you know, so we collapsed uh, before the, uh, uh, you know, with just radar observations uh, from 2017 and normal astrometric observations, the uh, gravitational um, determination was at about a three sigma level. Um, but, um, but we collapsed the errors by adding all these occultations into seven, eight, nine uh, sigma now. So we've improved the, um, um, shrunk the error in the uh, orbit of this object by about a factor of three. And this is um, the A2 term for most uh, um, near-Earth asteroids is caused by the Yarkovsky effect, the uneven heating uh, of the asteroid and re-radiation of, um, of the heat it collects during the day. Um, but in the case of Phaethon, it must be mass loss due to the strong thermal um, heating near perihelion is evidenced by the geminids and the dust trail that's actually been imaged by the Parker Solar Probe. Um, I noticed there was even a paper today that just came out talking about a sodium tail that has been observed from Phaethon as it uh, gets close to the sun. Um, anyway, this just shows the long-term orbit of, um, of, of Phaethon. It's a plot of the moid, the mean orbital intersection distance, uh, which is the distance of Phaethon's orbit till relative to the Earth's orbit. And you can see it goes to zero in 20, 2217, but there is no risk of impact since the period of the orbit is known very well. And um, the, the, they will not arrive at the intersection point at the same time. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, uh, there should be some great geminid meteor showers early in the 23rd century. So if you can uh, get your grandchildren to teach their grandchildren <laughs> to uh, look out for that. Um, uh, but, um, but Phaethon is a large asteroid. It's almost as large as the object that wiped out the dinosaurs. So we should keep close tabs on it since this A2 term could change. Its rubble pile structure could change with the sphere thermal shocks it suffers. So such a change might alter the orbit period enough to make it a concern in 200 years from now. But um, this just shows the uh, next Phaethon occultation coming up uh, on September 22nd. Um, but it's going to be quite different. It's a 10.7 magnitude star. Um, but uh, the challenge will be the it's in bright twilight. The sun altitude will be minus five degrees at best in Michigan and Ontario. Um, and so if you try that, uh, you, you can at least get on the star an hour beforehand and then track it as the twilight brightens, but uh, you can use a red filter or pole light rising filter to uh, darken the background. If you try this, be sure to test it beforehand. Um, but uh, this just shows another occultation coming up in November. Um, but next I'm going to switch now to Apophis which is going to pass uh, um, very close to the uh, geosynchronous uh, belt of satellites um, in 2029 April. Uh, so, and radar observations showed Apophis to be about 340 meters across and impact by an asteroid this large would destroy everything uh, instantly and within 25 kilometers and would produce severe damage out to 300 kilometers from the impact point. Uh, so obviously it's uh, been a concern to a lot of people. And uh, the, the thing is in 2029, when it passes close to the earth, um, it uh, could pass through a keyhole, which is a point in the plane that's um, perpendicular to the earth that the asteroid sees as it approaches it. Um, if it goes through one of these points, it will go into a resonant orbit that will return it back to the Earth um, um, several years later. And um, there, it'll come back in 2036, but um, it's going to, we know now it's going to pass quite far from the Earth. But there was a close approach in 2028, um, and there are some others coming up, where um, the possibility of an impact um, was not zero. Um, so, um, so we were interested in determining the orbit of Apophis more accurately. Um, but um, 
anyway, the uh, um, this shows uh, an event that was found by the Lucky Star Project, an occultation of an eighth magnitude star um, crossing the uh, central United States. Um, there was also an occultation of a seventh magnitude star a month earlier, but without radar observations, it could not be predicted well enough. And we didn't try a big campaign because we just knew it couldn't be, uh, um, um, you know, a campaign probably wouldn't be effective like we had for faith on. But then they found this other event with an 8.4 magnitude star and the radar observation were expected a few days before. So we uh, set up a plan like we did for faith on, but on a you know, smaller uh, separation to catch the smaller asteroid. Um, and we were successful. This shows the uh, um, um, uh, you know, six uh, IOTA observers deployed telescopes across uh, um, the region around uh, uh, Oakdale, Louisiana, and it conveniently went over this um, um, general aviation airport, um, which was closed at night, but they let us uh, set up several of our stations there. But uh, we set up in this uh, dense pattern of only 107 meter spacing on the ground and uh, filled a lot of these uh, lines, not all of them. But um, you can see the red dots mark stations that had no occultation and the green dots actually had a short occultation by Apophis. This was the first ever recording of an Apophis occultation. Um, the, um, um, the predicted path was uh, JPL uh, 204, that's the path that we expected the path to be up here, um, but uh, you can see it went farther south. Um, but, uh, um, but, but a later prediction showed the path might have been here, but we know it was down here. Um, anyway, I'll go on to that. Based upon these observations, well, the uh, this just shows uh, the two observations that we made um, at, state, at lines A28 and A30. Um, we had these small um, um, uh, 80 millimeter refractors with sensitive cameras on them um, that uh, recorded the occultation. They were pre-pointed and uh, we set up five of these uh, uh, systems um, to, um, to, to observe it. Uh, we, this just shows the pictures from a practice run we did three nights before. Um, this shows the light curves of the observations. Um, and between us at station A29 was uh, Richard Nugent using a, uh, um, uh, an eight inch uh, Celestron telescope. Uh, so uh, you can see the, uh, 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 this is the light curves from A30 a29 and a28 here, um, you know, showing and there was an exact time coincidence of all these observations. Um, anyway, um, four nights later, there was an occultation of a ninth magnitude star um, that was predicted to cross Europe. And of course, uh, Europe's weather uh, lived up to its name and was mostly cloudy everywhere, but it, it was clear um, in northeastern Greece, two observers from Thessalonica went right to the predicted path, now updated with the um, um, information we got from uh, the um, um, March 7th occultation. And um, they set up within the path and they had no occultation. So we were quite concerned um, about this because we had another occultation coming up anyway. Anyway, uh, this is the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the orange lines here show the uh, limits of the predicted path from JPL solution 207. Um, a later prediction where we sorted out the op occultation better is JPL 214A, which I'll explain later, and its path was up here. So this shows why they had no occultation. But at the time, they didn't know that. We were all in the dark. You know, so we really, it was frustrating because we actually succeeded in observing the occultation. And now the prediction uh, for the next event showed we had missed it. Uh, so we were in danger of actually losing it. Um, 
But then on March 22nd, we had this 10th magnitude occultation in the eastern US. Um, and uh, several of us tried to observe the events and they all, we all had a miss, but Roger Venable deployed his five large telescopes near Yeehaw Junction, Florida, along Florida Highway um, 60. And, um, and you can see the red dots, he had four misses. This is the predicted path that uh, as best we knew it, from JPL 207, but then um, um, his easternmost station actually got an occultation. Uh, so um, with these observations, Roger Venable actually saved Apophis's accurate orbit. Um, so this is a later prediction based upon his observation and a couple of later events. Um, um, anyway, um, so anyway, we suspected there was a problem with the Gaia data for NY Hydri, which was uh, the star that was occulted on March 7th um, that we observed in Louisiana, the eighth magnitude star. It's a known eclipsing binary. Um, so, uh, so for the predictions for the later events, we gave the March 22nd observations higher weight for their new orbit 211 um, used to predict this event, uh, but we weren't sure uh, because we just had that one other point and the two points didn't line up. But the eight stations uh, were set up at 140 meters across this, the sky plane conservative due to the discrepancy between those two results. Again, five stations by Roger Venable. Um, but the star was uh, um, a little fainter than the previous events, so the larger telescopes were needed, but three positive observations were recorded, um, which confirmed the JPL 211 path. So it was correct to downweight the uh, um, earlier observation and give higher weight to March 22nd. And then a week later, there was another event, a 10th magnitude star, it was occulted in a similar path across New Mexico. And um, in this case, only three observers tried it. Um, and um, Kai Gatras, though, one of those, set up his 20-inch um, Dobsonian telescope and you was able to record it at high speed with the um, um, QHY camera. Um, and this is the recording that, that he got uh, showing it. At, uh, we uh, got a good, good, you know, three-point fit again. So we got great data. Uh, so um, this shows all of the uh, Apophis occultations that have been observed and showing their the residuals from um, the so-called orbit 214A. Uh, 214 is the um, the orbit that uh, was computed at JPL using all the occultations, but downweighting the March 7th ones. Um, but um, I asked uh, David, David Afrenosia, the fellow who generated the prediction, uh, please generate an orbit also where you don't include March 7th at all in your solution. So he did that just using the um, uh, March 2nd, 22nd and the April 4th um, occultation to form uh, 214A. And this shows the residuals relative to that. You can see they're all um, less than half a milli arc second. Uh, so we really got a good uh, you know, pinned it down whale. But you can see um, the residuals for uh, the March 7th event are way off. And so and it's just because the star was um, in, not in the Gaia position where we expected it. So we've actually used um, Apophis here is a fine-tuned astrometric tool to find errors in Gaia, um, which is kind of incredible when you think about it. Um, the, um, so it was just fortunate that Roger Venable was able to succeed on March 22nd um, to uh, you know, find that out. Um, and this uh, shows another um, a picture talking about the evolution and time of knowledge of the Yakarsky acceleration for Apophis. Um, this was compiled from, you know, normal astrometric observations and radar observations. Um, and you can see the last observations are blown up uh, here. Um, and uh, the 
uh, sea observation here was uh, calculated uh, based upon the radar observations, which the radar observations were only found, by the way, a day before, you know, the, where they really were uh, confident of the, uh, of the radar detection, um, um, a day before the uh, observation of that um, March 7th occultation. So we had to, they had to scramble to get the orbit solution based upon the radio radar from just three nights of observations. And we had to scramble to set up our lines of observers. Uh, but, um, um, yeah, but then, um, um, then uh, point D here show, you know, point, the red point shows the addition of the March uh, 7th. Um, occultation showing how the air has been collapsed uh, even more. Uh, so anyway, based upon this, um, we know that Apophis is going to miss those keyholes for those near-term um, impacts. So we know there's no risk by Apophis hitting the earth at least in the next 100 years. Uh, so um, um, after that, though, we really need to keep monitoring the orbit so we can see um, how it evolves. Um, um, this just shows uh, some upcoming events, uh, but most of them have passed now. Uh, one was observed on May 6th in uh, Arizona and one observer in Mexico. Uh, so, um, and the uh, next U.S. event we have is coming up on September 27th. That was observed from four stations. Um, anyway, um, uh, during the summer, Apophis has been too close to the sun, no, so no observers occurred then. But in September, um, it's coming out of the sun again. But now the event durations become much shorter, so only brighter stars have a reasonable chance to be recorded. And... Um, Oh, this shows the, uh, the, the faith on occultation that I already talked about. I, you know, I had that somewhere. Um, this just shows the occultations of um, all, uh, I mean, that's uh, that faith on occultation and the Apophis one on, uh, um, on September 27th, which is going to be visible at low altitude uh, with an eighth magnitude star in Georgia. Um, at the uh, coast, near the coast of, uh, near the Florida border. Um, that's the uh, next occultation by Apophis. But, um, but this shows uh, all the events coming up in 2022 that I have found. There's a few with a faith on, and um, uh, just one with Apophis. Again, it's an eighth magnitude star, but the duration is only two hundredths of an arc second, which is just one single video field. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult to observe, just like it's almost a carbon copy of the September 27th occultation. Uh, so uh, the September 27th, the altitude is eight degrees at the coast. Here it's 10 degrees. So, um, but, um, but this show shows you do have opportunities, but these paths are keep in mind, they're all very narrow. You have to travel them if you're gonna see these and preferably in groups to set up multiple stations. Um, uh, this just shows a, a list of all the events with their details. Of course, I can't go through it, but it gives some information about the different objects um, that are called it. And uh, this is the one of Apophis. I didn't make this bold here. But um, one of the more interesting occult um, ones, this group is Didymos. Um, uh, Didymos is of high interest because NASA is sending their uh, DART mission, the double asteroid redirect uh, um, you know, mission, um, uh, plans to impact Dimorphos, which is a 160 moon of Didymos. Didymos itself is 800 meters across, but the moon is quite a bit smaller and is orbiting about 1.2 kilometers away. Um, it's going to impact it on September 30th, um, 2022, if all goes to plan. Um, but um, what, what we have to get a first occultation. Uh, you know, we don't have um, you know, a real precise orbit for Didymos at the moment, uh, but um, it's, it's pretty good, I think, enough that we can organize a campaign to observe some of these earlier events. But the idea is once you observe 
any one of those Didymos occultations, then you can observe the next one more intently. You've got the orbit pinned down better. And, um, and, and that's just like Apophis and, uh, and Phaethon, where you can improve the predictions uh, as time goes on. Um, but um, um, also, uh, besides these events, there's also an event in next year in Hawaii um, uh, that uh, might be observed. Uh, so, yeah, but um, we're especially interested in Didymos because of this uh, DART program. They want to, what they want to do is measure, change the impact of, of the spacecraft on the asteroid will change the orbit period by what they believe a few minutes. And you can see that over time as the period, um, um, as the period change accumulates over time, then you can fit light curve observations and um, where you can see the transits and eclipses of the, uh, by the um, satellite, uh, the main astro object. But if you could get occultations, you could get even more um, accuracy in the uh, determination of the period um, of the moon. <laughs> Next, I'll quickly go through in the time I have left to um, uh, talk about our tools. Um, um, one of the most important ones is some software that you can record, so-called occult watcher, that you can use to find events near your location. And so all you do, you go to the configuration tab up here, and you pull down, you input your um, latitude and longitude, <laughs> and, um, and then you set different event filters and so-called different prediction feeds, um, and then you just press a button and it uh, generates a list of all the events coming up for the next two months. It just goes two months into the future. And, um, and this, uh, um, these were, is a list that I computed for uh, Salem, Oregon back in, uh, um, uh, you know, back for, uh, in, in May when I gave a talk to them. Um, so uh, it, it shows, uh, um, the IOTA updates are the main ones, and then there are fainter events from the so-called low magnitude feed. Um, but Cardinals did not support anything. Okay. Um, okay. Anyway, um, this just shows um, you know, um, what you have to pay to get. Um, um, to, to, to gear up to do occultations um, with extra equipment. I mean, you can spend a lot or you can spend a little. You can spend zero dollars if you use visual methods and use two smartphones, one to record and one to generate audible time signals. You know, we used to use shortwave radios for the time signals, but now that can be done with, um, um, with um, smartphones. But IOTA really encourages going to video or, or with um, you know, CCD observations um, rather than visual. Um, but um, um, if you have an astronomical CCD and a computer to record images with it, then you can also use the so-called drift scan technique. Now you have to sync your computer clock accurately um, uh, you know, a couple of minutes before the occultation. You can do that pretty well with Dimension 4 and you know, some of these other, some software and there's website until it's how it's done. Um, but, if, but if you have a computer, but not a CCD for video, you can, for 20 bucks or so, you can build a, buy a device to mount your smartphone to the eyepiece of the telescope, and then you can use it to record while you record an, the, the audio time signals uh, from another smartphone. Um, but, um, uh, but, but better than that, uh, you can gain about three magnitudes by using a sensitive security camera that you can attach to your telescope. And IOTA has been selling these, the RunCan camera, and this gives the different uh, things um, that you need to go along with it. And we sell these in a kit, but this camera is no longer manufactured and soon more expensive cameras will be needed. And you know, we do have uh, a few of these left in the inventory, but they'll probably disappear within a couple of weeks. Um, but for about $700, you can buy a Waytech camera, but the supply of them is also limited. Um, 
for $1,300, the QHY GPS camera is a good choice. Um, or if you want to fork out a little bit more money, you can get the EV scope, the Unistellar EV scope, um, which, um, um, which is a very nice uh, a telescope because it'll not only record the occultation, but it will also find the target star for you automatically. Um, but um, the uh, um, it does have problems because it depends upon uh, cell phone time, um, and so its timing accuracy is limited. But that can be improved with a flasher device um, that can be used also with other um, um, other. Um, uh, CCD cameras that record uh, in video format. Um, but anyway, use whatever you have. Any observation is better than no observation. But, uh, but we prefer good timing if you can. This is, we say we'd prefer CCD observations to visual techniques. This just shows using smartphones and um, um, different ideas for timing. This shows the uh, web page about the drift scan timing of occultations where you take a, a scan trail of the star and then the occultation reveals itself with a break and then you uh, have to measure the the trail carefully um, from the start and the end of the exposure um, this just shows a video setup uh, um, um, of the uh, the small camera and the equipment to record it. Um, this just shows a small stick recorder, which is also um, hard to come by these days, but you can use any uh, PC to record the occultations, or you can do this in your observatory. Um, this talks about the options for the run cam camera, but um, the supply is limited. We are going to try to see if we can get some of the chips or design and Possibly we can construct these in the US maybe a year from now or so. I don't know. We'll see. Um, this just shows a view of the equipment, typical equipment again. And, um, and so, um, and this just shows the IOTA VTI, the accurate time insertion device, which is about $270. But um, with this flasher unit, with um, uh, we can do the accurate timing more cheaply, uh, but uh, with a little more analysis. Um, anyway, uh, this talks about um, the uh, resources available on our occultations.org main IOTA website, um, uh, especially uh, go to the, uh, um, the observing tab there. And uh, there's also a, uh, um, a good document that George Viscom has made, put together a primer um, that with the link is given there. Um, anyway, this is just an overall uh, uh, view. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, recently the occultation technique was successfully applied to Apophis, which is more than 10 times smaller than Phason, further demonstrating the astrometric power of observations of NEO occultations, um, especially for planetary defense purposes. Um, and information about the sizes, shapes, rings and satellites, and even atmospheres of Kuiper Belt objects, centaurs, Trojans, and other asteroids is proportional to the number of stations that can be played to observe them. So we encourage as many as possible to time occultations by, occulta by you know, from their observatories. Whoops, uh, previous. Um, but um, we hope that the pursuit of uh, near Earth uh, Near-Earth object occultations will inspire a new generation of astronomers to learn, apply, and improve the techniques for mobile occultation observation, like lunar grazing occultations did for our generation in the 1960s and 70s. And this gives the different resources. We'll, these are available online. Uh, uh, we'll put it more prominently on the OIOTA website where you can link to it. Um, and um, I've... Um, I, I think I've used up just under an hour now. So if there are any questions, I'm open to that. Yes, Dr. Dunn, that's incredible. Uh, I have one question that came to me on my cell phone from someone asking uh, how narrow the paths can, can be and whether you have trouble with your team finding observing locations within those paths. 
Oh yes, all the time. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> for the near Earth objects, I mean, for the main belt ob occultations and TNOs and things, the, the, the paths are much wider. But as you saw for um, um, Apophis occultations, the paths are only as wide as the asteroids. So, you know, about a, um, you know, and, and, and when we're trying to put station observers precisely um, at, um, you know, as close as 100 meters apart, you know, the length of a football field, um, and you want to be, a, you know, have position them to a tenth of that accuracy. So the order of, um, um, you know, 30, 40 feet or so, 50 feet or so of a given line across the Earth's surface, and that crosses roads and so forth. You have to find places where you can park your car and um, and have a view of the object and so forth. And uh, especially when you uh, re re deploying remote stations, you want to uh, um, have security, be able to hide them behind bushes and things. Uh, uh, but um, um, but, but anyway, yeah, it's an interesting challenge and, uh, and, and we, uh, it's uh, part of the game that uh, um, you, you go to places you never expected you'd visit <laughs> when you chase these things. And I had one other question that came in. Uh, do the people who, uh, for whom the occultations are grazing, uh, are they able to determine surface features with any significance? Um, Yes, uh, we um, we um, do occasionally get grazes by asteroids, of course, where um, a number of times observers have seen uh, two occultations instead of just one. And you know a lot of the asteroids are peanut-shaped like arrows, and you can get the two ends if it lines up right. Mm -hmm. The two ends of the asteroid will occult the uh, star. There's even one time when I got an occultation you know, by three features at the edge of the asteroid. You know, so, um, but you can also get two occultations if you have a moon of the asteroid. So, so, so but you, you know, usually you know if it's a, a moon or a graze uh, by the fact that for a moon will always be um, you know, some large fraction of the, or a, a, will be more than the central duration of the occultation. You know, if it's more than that central duration away from the main event, then then it's more likely a moon. But if it's um, if it's much less than the main central duration, then you've got a graze. Okay. Could I ask you to uh, uh, stop your screen share so we can see you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Wait, whoops. No, I got the wrong thing. Um, I can do it for see. you. Here we go. Okay. We go. Yeah. Thank fine. You. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, there, there is. Um, well, just some comments here. Uh, Mike Overacker saying this would be a great use of the tracking system I installed on my home built 15 inch Dobsonian. I think you've inspired a lot of people to get involved in this. Um, and uh, personally, my question is, is, you know, what is it like? Uh, what are the feelings like when you are observing a grazing occultation? Oh, it's it's like in a total eclipse of the sun or how do oh you yeah yeah it's 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 exhilarating each occultation is uh you, you never know what's going to happen and so it's always interesting i mean we have a pretty good idea especially with lunar grazes now and, and that's the problem uh, there's not that much value in observing those events anymore uh, but they're still occurring um and um and occasionally we go out and and observe them anyway. Um, and if you go to that um, um, video, which was done in Toronto or area, suburb of Toronto, um, by members of the uh, North York Astronomical Association, um, uh, they recorded the uh, uh, grazing occultation of Aldebaran by a first quarter moon in uh, March of 2017 um, from five stations across the path and each one of them video recording the occultation with color cameras and so they got a remarkable record and they lined up uh, all those recordings oh. and you can see them then the star disappearing and reappearing um, um, in you know oh. as uh, you know one of the stations had 24 events and the others had fewer events but you can see how the uh, um, the, the profile of the moon is actually, uh, 
you know, shown audibly from their calls out of the event wow. and the fact of the star flashing on and off in their videos. Uh, so I encourage people to look at that to, to get a feel for what these events are like. And you hear it, right? I mean, it's like, yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. It they, sound like music to you, I would imagine. So, yes, yes. <laughs> what is the most distant occulting body you've observed? Um, the, um, that I have observed, um, we, we observed a, a TNO, it's, I think we observed an occultation by Ixion, I don't remember if we got that or not, I think we did, yeah, but we, we, we got one um, trans-Neptunian object, which was wow. about four, 40 AU or 35 AU away or so. Um, yeah, yeah, we we were we we participated in the Southwest Research Institute's expedition to Patagonia that successfully observed the occultation by uh, Arakoth, you know, the object that um, New Horizons spacecraft flew by. Uh, so we we didn't get a positive cord in that one, but we uh, got you know bracketing miss observations. Joan was actually the closest observer. Um, on the north side of that object, and um, and I was a few lines on the south side, but there were, you know, five successful cords for that event wow. uh, by other observers in the team. So it has to be, you know, those events are best done as a as a team effort uh, when possible. Dr. Dunham, I want to really thank you for joining us tonight. It was fantastic, and uh, I, I agree with Scott. I think you've probably stimulated some new interest among people who haven't explored this before. Thank you for joining us tonight so much. Thank you. I'm uh, okay. glad that uh, if I've even just got a few people and spark their interest, that's uh, it's entirely successful. So, so we look forward to uh, you, um, um, you know, looking at our main website, occultations.org. And, um, and if uh, once you get involved with it, you should join our uh, very active uh, email group, the IOTA Occultations uh, dot groups IO. Um, so, um, so there's on the main occultations dot org. There's information about how to, you know, get into that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have some door prizes to give out, and Terry, you with me? Yep, I'm here. All right. First one we have is John Larson in the room. Yes, sir. Hello. Good to Hello. see you tonight. Thank you. Uh, John is with the Omaha Astronomical Society that has very kindly offered a $200 high point gift certificate, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me first of all draw the number and then I'll let you talk about your club for a second. Okay. Terry, the number is... Three eight four. Thank you. Is that unused? Uh, you'll know. I'll have to look. Okay. Well, interrupt if it if it I is. I sure will. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay, John. All right. So uh, I'm John Larson. I'm the president of the Omaha Astronomical Society, and I want to take this moment to say thank you for letting us talk about our club here in Alcon. Um, our club kind of traces its route back to the Great Plains Astronomy Club, which was started in 1938, which pretty much covered the Omaha and Lincoln, Nebraska areas. But OAS became incorporated in 1962. That's when our articles of incorporation were done. And sometime later, uh, we became a nonprofit in the 2000s. Next year, we will have our 60th anniversary in 2022 in May. So... I better get planning something, shouldn't I? Uh, OAS has about 180 memberships. So if I count like the, the couples and the families, that's roughly like 217 people. Uh, our meetings are the first Friday of each month. They typically were at the University of Nebraska, Omaha in the Durham Science Building. But um, after uh, the health crisis began in March, 2020, we immediately switched into zoom mode and uh, our numbers in the zoom meeting has been pretty good anywhere from 35 to 40 people uh, for each meeting and we're hoping to do hybrid meetings this fall um, we just got word yesterday that we'll be able to go back in person in the in the uh, university so it'd be nice to have some in-person meeting time 
Uh, one of the things we've done over the last two years is we've set up a Discord server for all of our members to collaborate and discuss on things and show their astrophotography. That's been very popular. And if you are familiar with the Nebraska Star Party, many of our members of OES do help run NSP. Uh, we do have a lot of outreach every year. We reach, oh gosh, several thousand students and adults every year, typically when it's not COVID. And we do have regularly scheduled events uh, on the second Tuesday of each month and we call Astronomy in the Parks. We have uh, our Astro Park, which is our darker sky facility. Uh, light pollution is an ever encroaching problem. And when the site was purchased in the uh, 80s, the light wasn't as bad, but uh, it has been steadily encroaching over time, especially with quarries and things down in the same area. But it's around 40 to 50 minutes south of Omaha. And uh, <clears throat> that's my presentation. Our website is omahaastro.com. Well, John, thank you so much for uh, sponsoring the Door Prize. We really appreciate it. And uh, good luck avoiding the lights. I know that's a problem everywhere. I watched my own dark sky site go from probably Bortle 10 when I was a kid to probably something in the seven range just in uh, that time. So uh, thank you again. And Terry, uh, who is the winner of the High Point gift card from Omaha? Astronomical Frank, Frank Kenny. Frank Kenny. Frank Kenny. Congratulations, Frank. Okay. Robert Togney, are you with us? Yes. Welcome. Hi. Okay. Uh, Robert is with the Central Arkansas Astronomical Association, and I believe you are providing a pair of Vortex 10 by 50 binoculars. Is that correct? Uh, 8 by 42. I'm sorry, to 42, excuse me. I can't read my own writing here. And let me, uh, first of all, draw the number for those. <clears throat> okay. Terry, that number will be 565. Five. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I will stop sharing. Tell us a little about your club. Okay. Um, should have had this started. Uh, I'm with the Central Arkansas Astronomical Society and uh, most, most uh, a lot of our members are from Little Rock, but uh, there's people all around uh, Little Rock. Uh, we uh, meet at River Ridge Observatory. Um, it was founded in 1971 as the uh, Mid South Astronomical Research. Let's say. Uh, Society or Mars and. Uh, um, in the mid 80s, with the enthusiasm brought about by Halley's Comet, uh, we purchased land uh, northwest of Little Rock up on the ridge above the uh, Arkansas River. And this is our observatory. Uh, we've got uh, five, five uh, telescopes um, and uh, a meeting room and two meeting rooms. Uh, lots of pads and stuff, and we have some really good, really good times up there. Um, about about that time, we changed the name to CAS or Central Arkansas Astronomical Society. Over the years, uh, there's been a lot of a lot of additions and lit, and then buildings torn down and rebuilt and stuff like that. Um, we've actually got a, our observatories. Four of them are uh, remote. Are remote. Uh, Observatories, three of them by individuals, and one by uh, um, one by. I'll, I've got a slide on that in a second. Uh, we have regular star parties in conjunction with state parks parks in the area. They've uh, taken a back seat during COVID, but we're think, hoping to get started again pretty soon. Uh, have special events for the club around International Observe the Moon Night eclipses which we've got one coming right through Central Arkansas in, in uh, 2024, Astronomy Day and, and other astronomical events. We have off-site events and events at the uh, observatory with schools and school groups, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. 
Um, we have uh, things like the Messier Marathon, uh, uh, astrophotography mentoring sessions, and other mentoring sessions. Uh, we're working with a lot of libraries around Arkansas, and uh, along with our sister organization, and so we have uh, about 70 scopes at 12 locations and 15 more scopes on the way. Uh, we're members of the Astronomical League, the International Dark Sky Association and the Night Sky Network. We have, we've got a, a remote telescope that's available to club members and, and it's in, in conjunction with Arkansas Tech University, uh, the River Ridge Observatory Robotic Research Telephone. Telescope, R R O R R T. Anyway, uh, uh, can't we we keep it pretty loaded up with projects, and it, it it's it's good for uh, our observing programs, Aaron. If you're still there, um, ANSA is our sister society. The Arkansas is an uh, Arkansas affiliate of the uh, International Dark Sky Association. It's uh, Arkansas Natural Sky Association. Uh, we're active in pr promoting dark skies to communities and utility companies through education. And uh, last, about two years ago, I think we, su we successfully got the Buffalo Natural River qualified as a dark sky park. Uh, and we've, we were hoping to have a dark sky festival. We had it all set up this year, but it's been canceled due to COVID. We're moving it to next year. And the door prize is an 8 by 42 crossfire binoculars plus a um, a uh, book by Phil Harrington, Touring the Universe for the, Through Binoculars. Uh, and then uh, uh, a book that ANSA publishes, Learning the Constellations, that, that kind of goes about the constellations uh, in a different way, learning them through uh, the Summer Triangle, learn it, and then you learn the rest of them, the Fall Square, uh, Winter Hexagon, and Spring Diamond. So anyway. That's okay. It. Okay. Thank you. Rocky also uh, uh, coordinates three of our observing programs, the uh, variable star program, the binocular variable star program, and the carbon star program. Did I get them all? Yeah, that's I think, right. I think I've submitted to you on all three of those in the past. And thank you for all that work that you do as well. Terry, uh, who wins these Vortex binoculars, which I know are excellent? Jeannie Knight. Congratulations, Jeannie. And thank you again uh, um, for your club. And I apologize for saying association. We're swimming in 94 speakers, award winners, and, and door prize donors. And I've got associations and societies all mixed up sometimes. So I apologize. It is the Central Arkansas Astronomical Society, right? Correct name. Thank you. OK. Yep. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to draw now for the Olympic Astronomical Society. This will be our last door prize for the evening. It's a two power Barlow focal extender and an AstroTech 24 millimeter illuminated reticle, total value $240. And we'll draw for that number 643. Thank you. Okay. And I will promise that I showed, would show their logo. So I'll just do this. They are in Bremerton, Washington, uh, educating Kitsap County since 1969. And uh, I know Mark Simonson's uh, involved with this club as well as uh, the Everett Society. Okay. So we'll you have a winner? Yes. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Tom Taylor. Okay, Tom. Got some equipment coming your way. Congratulations. And that will do it for session seven. Session eight will begin. We'll start it in 10 minutes, about two minutes, uh, about uh, 947 Eastern time. And we'll be back with uh, Connell Richards and Dr. Brian Haydett. You'll You'll enjoy both of these speakers. They're very enthusiastic and uh, stimulating to listen to. Okay.
Hey, Rocky, where are you guys located in particular? Uh, in, uh, I'm in Haver Springs, but uh, the astronomy club's mostly out of Little Rock Little in Rock. the uh, okay. observatories north, northwest in, in Little Italy, Arkansas. Okay. Near Little Italy. Mm -hmm. I'll have to come down there sometime. Where are you? Uh, in Springdale, Arkansas. Oh, okay. Explorer, Explorer Scientific. Oh, okay. oh, this is John um, Scott talking. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. I couldn't <laughs> tell who was who was talking. <laughs> and the voice behind the Alcon virtual sign. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> it seems like you have a real exciting club. That's great. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. Bruce McMath keeps us going. I bet he does. Hello.
Terry, are you there? Yep. Yeah. Uh, would you give me, uh, let me uh, say something for about 15 seconds before, and then I'll turn it over to you for the intro. All right. Oh, never mind. I'll, I'll just do it after. That's OK. No, no I, 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 I there, right there's, there's no sense going back and forth twice. OK. Scott, are you there? Yes. I have a question. Can we put the list of winners on in place of where we're doing the timing? Between the yeah. Um, okay. Uh, not today, but tomorrow uh, during the day. Sure. We'll that's, start then. That's and not I'll, a problem at all. Okay. I will complete that list with tonight's winners on it too. From yeah, the I can put it in so as, um, you know, with the logo on the side and the, you know, list of winners. Okay. Is a That'd be great. Uh, can you do it? So. Okay, that'll work. All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, this will be our last session for this evening. Uh, we will be presenting the Horkheimer Smith Award. Connell Richards will be here speaking to us about rising stars, the next generation of amateur astronomers. Brian Haydit is here and he will be speaking with us about the hunt for near Earth objects and planetary radar. And we've got $745 worth of door prizes to hand out. So with that, I am going to hand it back to Chuck Allen. Thank you very much. Uh, our Horkheimer Smith Award is our highest award for service by young people uh, of under college age, of, of high school age, I should say. Uh, it's funded uh, by the Horkheimer Charitable Fund, and we owe a great debt of gratitude both to Jack Horkheimer, the late Jack Horkheimer, for his support of the league and uh, Dwight Horkheimer's support of us through the Charitable Fund. The Horkheimer Smith Award carries a prize of $1,750. Uh, and this year, after multiple judges reviewed the service award, we had a dead top for first place, and we are providing the full $1,750 prize to both of the young people who won the award. Uh, we honored one of the uh, winners earlier, uh, Ty Westerling, and tonight we're honoring Connell Richards, the other winner of the Smith Daria Award this year. Uh, Connell is an honor graduate of Abington Heights High School uh, in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania, near Scranton, Pennsylvania. He was president and founder of the Astronomy Club at his high school, the Abington uh, Heights High School Astronomy Club, which is a league member society, by the way. And uh, that society is dedicated to uh, public outreach and especially outreach to young people in the community. He basically instructed a number of students uh, uh, in the school in becoming teachers of astronomy to others. He created a website uh, with his own observing guides that he created and also uh, added links to books and magazines and other learning resources uh, uh, related to astronomy. Uh, he created a number of social media accounts in which he uh, uh, added videos concerning SpaceX Crew Dragon launch, uh, the dimming of Betelgeuse earlier in the last year, Perseverance uh, landing, uh, the Mercury transit and the Great Conjunction of 2020. Uh, in 2020, he also sponsored a Mars Week online and produced a series of two minute videos on climate, geology and exploration of Mars. He curated a list of online resources for self-learning and astronomy, 
created live streams from such organizations as a little observatory and posted images from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. He has written articles for Reflector uh, and has participated repeatedly in our league live events and in the Global Star Parties hosted by Scott Roberts on the Explore Scientific uh, Global Star Party uh, series, which are held each week on Tuesday. Uh, he is coming to us from Penn State University now, where he will be majoring uh, in aerospace engineering. And he is in the middle of an extremely busy week, I'm sure, with orientation and the beginning of classes very soon, if they haven't already. And Connell, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on winning the Horkheimer Smith Dari Award for 2021. Thank you very much, Chuck. I appreciate that. You can you hear me okay? You, yes, I can. Do you have the plaque there? You probably don't, do you? No, I don't, but I can pull up the picture. I, I featured okay. it in my presentation. Oh, okay. Well, we'll just wait for that. Uh, and and how's how's class or has class started yet at Penn State? No, class is starting Monday right now. Monday? So we're going okay. to orientations this week and getting ready to go. Well, I appreciate your taking the time to join us tonight. Uh, Connell is speaking to us tonight. Uh, on a topic that he has been helping the league with and with and helping the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada with, and that's how to attract young people to astronomy. And so we'd like him to speak on that tonight. And Connell, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Chuck. I'll share my screen here. I'll uh, let me know if you can see everything okay. I always like to double check. Sure. There we go. All right. Well, I'd like to start off by thanking everyone for providing me the opportunity to speak at Alcon. In spite of all the challenges we've had in putting together a conference of this scale and this depth uh, through the coronavirus pandemic, I think we've really done a great job. I've, I've really admired how well the league has done everything, and I truly appreciate the opportunity to speak on the value of fueling our hobby with more young people and more amateur astronomers to carry the I suppose, torch of the hobby forward. So the title of my talk is Rising Stars, the Next Generation of Amateur Astronomers. Uh, we have a, a great number of young people, um, at least in, in my experience, who I've met right now, who have been fascinated by astronomy for a long time. And they're always curious about it. In my experience with my clubs, they were asking questions. They were very engaged. And I think there is a great desire right now among young people to explore the subject of astronomy more and, and perhaps engage in it at a, a level that we do where they can go out and explore the night sky for themselves with binoculars or a telescope or even the naked eye. Uh, because as we all know, there is quite a lot to see regardless of, of what equipment you're using or how skilled you are. Uh, it's always very rewarding. So a little bit of background about myself. I began observing about five years ago. I received a six inch Newtonian telescope for my birthday. And that's been my closest, uh, I, I suppose, companion in the field ever since. My favorite start uh, clusters to observe include M13, M92. Uh, they've been some favorite objects of mine. I like the spiral galaxies as well. The Virgo galaxy cluster is a really nice treat in the spring, uh, regardless of whether you're observing the brighter members like M87 or, or some of the dimmer galaxies there. And sharing that passion of, obser of observing my favorite objects, I've spoken at League Live, and a couple of the Global Star Party events hosted by Explore Scientific uh, over this summer so far. I hope to continue with those in the future. Now, I also authored an article on a similar topic to this called Reaching Out to the Future, and that was in the League's Reflector magazine, their June issue this summer. And in that article, I outlined a lot of what I'm going to share with you all today in reaching out to young people and ensuring that our hobby continues forward with a motivated and experienced and excited and engaged body of amateur astronomers. And lastly, I'm the Abington Heights High School Astronomy Club founder and president. My junior year of high school, I really wanted to start a club and I was looking around and thinking, how can I share my passion with so many other people? And I met up with a couple of friends and we agreed that we wanted to start a club then. And we thought, well, is this going to take off? Are people going to be interested? We had some doubt in our mind at that time and I remember we were gathering up everyone we knew and we were asking them to, if they were interested. The high school principal at the time asked us um, if we could provide a, a list of, uh, of members with the demonstrated interest along with advisors 
and all of the other details that go into forming a club. And we weren't sure exactly how that would play out. We were told we needed 15 members um, in the astronomy club and that we would need that same number of demonstrated interest to prove that the club could continue forward. So we were going around school. It only took us about a day or two and we came up with a list of 37 signatures. And I remember one of my favorite moments in my hobby of astronomy was coming to the principal's office and delivering that to him and uh, launching our club with such a great body of interest. And my point in, in, in sharing all of this is that many people today have lamented that maybe young people aren't interested in astronomy or that they don't have the time, uh, but nothing could be further from, from, from this case. I think many young people are just thrilled to explore astronomy. They're fascinated by space flight. They're fascinated by the stars. They're fascinated by astrophysics. And they have many questions that they want to ask about it. And I think our role as amateur astronomers is to come in and conduct our outreach work and share it with them and bring it right to where they are, which I'll speak to a little bit later on. Now, to tell you a little bit more about my club, we did have a great demonstrated interest uh, throughout the COVID pandemic. We were one of only two clubs in our school to conduct online outreach events. So we created a website, we created an Instagram account where we shared uh, some astro images that I took, some wide field nightscapes, as well as some other images as well, because that summer we had the first test launch of SpaceX's Crew Dragon. And later in the fall, uh, just as we were starting up school again, Mars was at a very favorable obser uh, excuse me, opposition. And I know I had a lot of fun sketching and observing that. And I shared that with my class in uh, my Mars Week program, which was conducted through the uh, AHHS Astronomy Club. Now, as Chuck mentioned, we're also a league participant. We are a member society now. And I think that's a really great thing to uh, you know, be a part of because there are not many junior societies in the United States now. The league has approximately 300 member societies. And if I understand correctly, only about two or three of them are junior societies which used to be so abundant in the 60s and 70s throughout the space race. And we're trying to bring some of that back now and get young people really hooked into the hobby again. So if I can hop out of here for a second, um, actually I'll go to the next slide first. I do wanna share that website with you. So this is a little bit about our social media and a little bit about our website. We knew young people were on social media so much. We knew they were interacting through the internet. Uh, this was not only part of the age group we were trying to reach out to, but also part of the circumstances, given that this was mid to late 2020, and we knew so many people were spending time online, and this is how they were engaging with others. So you can see on the right here, we have our Astronomical League page, as it would appear on the phone. Uh, that's from our, our club website. And then on the left here, we have our Instagram account, where I had a couple of different images here. Uh, we had the anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's flight. We had the anniversary of Pluto's discovery for St. Patrick's Day. I talked a little bit about Lord Ross's telescope, the Leviathan of Parson Town, and how uh, Parsons himself explored M51 and discovered the spiral structure of galaxies for the first time. And through all of this work, through just a couple images or a short blurb that was on our website, we were, we were able to capture people's attention through very bite-sized uh, type media. It only takes a minute or two to read a short description or an article and you know scrolling through pictures is of course a very instant thing and that's what we need to do right now if we want to address the um you know a, a young body coming into astronomy we need to go to where they are and work with them and and work with the media that they do use so i'll go out of here for a second let me know if you can see my uh, website all right here can you see that fine chuck Okay, good. So I'll start off on the home screen. Um, this was the website I created. It was just a simple Google site, but it really went a long way in allowing us to extend the outreach of our club. So starting with our about page, we had our purpose and our, our reasoning for joining. Uh, Carl Sagan was, of course, a great science communicator, and he was known for saying that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience, which I certainly have found on my own. And I found that especially in sharing the hobby with others, I think it really opens your eyes to different things and it provides a great sense of perspective for our place in the universe. So that was my main reasoning for engaging people in the club. And a lot of people seem to follow with that and they really enjoyed that as well. Now our Astronomical League page, of course it's important to be part of a larger organization like the League. Uh, we can really come up with some great resources on our own, but it's also great to 
uh, be a part of a larger group like the league because we do have access to observing programs. And as a member society, we also have the Reflector magazine. And I mentioned down here the Youth Awards as well, which uh, Chuck just elaborated on a little bit earlier, like the NIA Award and the Youth Service Awards. Those are some really great opportunities to engage young people in a group like the league or a member society like our astronomy club. I had a great time uh, sharing the Reflector magazine and you know things like Sky and Telescope and Astronomy magazine. I had a list of references on the website as well, uh, a little bit later on here. And using those, I was able to uh, go through a lot of the materials that brought me into astronomy. I remember there were certain books, certain magazines, documentaries I watched, and there were all these different things that I knew were great resources to open the sky up to, to people who were new to it. So of course, Night Watch is a classic book. Eyes on the Sky was a great blog, Sky and Telescope magazine. Um, now I talk a lot about space flight too in, in our astronomy club. Um, while the Astronomical League is mainly astronomy focused, uh, space flight does have a major part of that as well. So I talked about launch calendars and I shared NASA's mission directory, which is a really fun website to explore with my club because you can go on and read about the Voyager and the Cassini missions, the Pioneer missions, or even recent uh, ventures like the Perseverance rover that just landed in February. But these resources, uh, I wanted to focus on things that were free and easily accessible and things that were very simple that opened the night sky up for me and really engaged my passion and interest. So I, I really was grateful to have the opportunity through our website and uh, in spite of the COVID pandemic to pass that interest along to others through those resources. Now, having established that, I wanted to create some of my own programming and that came around September, October, uh, maybe a little bit in August too, as Mars was coming to that opposition. Now, I know many of us turned our telescopes towards Mars during that time. And that was the first time I really got a good look at the planet because I was still building up my skills and building up my equipment and doing the best I could to observe it. And I remember looking in the telescope for the first night of, of observing Mars during that opposition and seeing Sirtis Major sticking out against that uh, bright pale desert. It was a really beautiful image. And I also got to watch the South Polar Cap shrink over a couple of weeks as the Martian Southern Hemisphere moved into spring and the ice started to recede a little bit. So I was just fascinated by the planet Mars. I figured it's so dynamic, it's so bright in our sky. Um, it's almost, I, I believe it's negative 1.5 or negative two magnitude. So it was very easy for people to see and also to track along the sky over a couple of different weeks. So this was something I knew I had to jump on and utilize as a part of programming for my club. So surrounding the week of Mars opposition, I, I took about five or six days and we created a new video for each day detailing a different aspect of exploring Mars. So we had climate and geology, we had exploration, we had uh, human missions there for the future. We talked, a lot of, uh, we talked a lot about different aspects of reaching out to the red planet and, and learning about this wonderful place that I could see in my telescope. And with that, I also provided some additional resources that were specific to this week. So uh, Mars Now was a really great resource from NASA. We also had Sky and Telescope's Mars Profiler for those with telescopes, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And I really did love using the data from this orbiter. Um, it flies over Mars and it takes pictures at a very high resolution. And you can see dunes and dust devils, ice receding, cliffs, uh, ancient lake beds and, and ancient deltas. It was really fascinating to scroll through those and share some of my favorites with my classmates. So that was a great opportunity for outreach, especially because it was, again, so easily accessible and, and free once again. The Lowell Observatory at the time was doing some great events where they were pointing their telescopes towards Mars and they would describe what the surface features were like. They had a webcam that you could view through and they also had some of their astronomers talking about what they were seeing and what the viewers were looking at. So really all you have to do is look around and if you wanna reach young people and go where they're at, they are, like I said, uh, the web has a tremendous number of resources through observatories, through NASA, uh, through the different spacecraft that are out there. And there, there really are some great resources to engage young people, um, especially if you're getting them right in their hands, right in social media and right on a website like this. So I'll, I'll just scroll briefly through the videos here. You can see the different topics, future exploration, climate and geology, uh, history and exploration. I talked about the canals that, 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 uh, Percival Lowell thought he observed all the way up to the modern missions where we're sending robotic rovers there and landers and drills and all kinds of things. 
And then I also talked about observing Mars. So I wanted to talk about not only what was there, but how students could observe it for themselves. With binoculars, you can compare Mars to different stars and understand how its brightness changes. With the naked eye, you can watch it retrograde as we pass by, the Earth passes by, and the planet's position seems to shift a little bit. And then of course, with the telescope, you can see all those beautiful surface features. Now going over to our Instagram account here, uh, this is where I conducted a lot of my outreach. I found a lot of my classmates were using this service and it was a great resource because it's, it's centered around uh, posting images and, and sharing things uh, through an image and a, a small description. So for St. Patrick's Day, I discussed Lord Ross's reflector, that being in, in rural Ireland in the center of the country. I talked about the Perseverance landing. I know many people had their eyes peeled straight to that landing and they were really excited to watch that uh, unfold and uh, the rover begin to conduct its science along with Ingenuity making its very exciting flights and then the Crew Dragon launch as well. So we had all kinds of different events uh, to engage people regardless of, of where they were interested in space and how that came to be. So we had the astronomers, the, the space flight enthusiasts, the engineers, everyone had an interest through this club. Now astrophotography was also a wonderful resource. This I posted personally and, and shared through a lot of my club meetings. I used it on my website. And this was a really fun project, not only for me to conduct myself and, and challenge myself in, in finding new objects and targets to explore in the night sky through the camera, but the best part about it was that I wasn't using sketches and I wasn't using notes. This was something concrete and solid that I could pass along to my classmates and say, here, this is what I saw. This is what's going on in the sky. And you can see this too. So on the left here, this was the Mercury transit. I believe that was in 2019 in November. Uh, we had Comet Neowise coming around. This was during its evening apparition. Uh, you can see the bucket of the Big Dipper right up there. This I believe was a Pearson meteor. Uh, I was imaging sometime in August of last year and it was just a couple days after, but if you trace the uh, ray, I, I suppose of the meteor back, uh, that goes pretty close to where the radiant is for the Pearson shower. I also did some star trails a lot. This was from a state park, not too far from where I live in Northeast PA. And I really enjoyed getting the campfire glow and the sky because you're connecting what people are so familiar with being the trees and the ground and, and a nice campfire during the summer along with the stars. So I, again, like I say, uh, a lot of people don't always look up at the stars. They know they're there. They know it's different in the country and maybe in the city, but getting people to look up and observe it for themselves and getting them to ask questions, that's always a really exciting process. And you know, once people are asking questions, they're hooked on the subject from there. And we all know the joy of having someone look through a telescope or look through binoculars for the first time and, and just watching that wow expression on their face and, and watching them really get into the hobby there. So continuing down, this was the solar eclipse we had earlier in the summer in June, uh, a shot of the moon. And then this was uh, back during the Christmas conjunction where we had a waxing crescent moon over here, just passing by Jupiter and Saturn. And I found that when I shared the, the, these photos, this astrophotography with my classmates and in my clubs, that hooked people the most because I wasn't just telling them something. It wasn't something from a website or NASA that seemed so far away. This was something that I did from my own backyard and that they could have done the same themselves. So that was a really exciting way of getting people involved. They knew that this was out there and they knew that they could really engage for themselves. And we were talking earlier, um, I was very honored and thrilled to receive the Horkheimer Smith Award, the Youth Service Award. And there's the plaque there. And eat, sleep, astronomy, repeat. We all know how that goes. Uh, I did that many times myself. But again, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, supporting me and achieving that award. And I'm really happy to continue along and, and share astronomy with others. Oops. <laughs> Now, the Global Star Party has been my main focus over the summer, um, especially thanks to Chuck Allen and Scott Roberts. I've been appearing on the Explore Scientific events. They, they've been going on every Tuesday night, as, as many of you know, for the uh, door prizes. And I've had the opportunity there to not only talk about my outreach, but also go a little bit deeper into subjects that, that I personally enjoyed. So this, this image here, this is from the uh, Comet session. And uh, we also had some on meteors and a couple other things as well. Oops. Now, I also conducted some library outreach. This was uh, once COVID was wrapping up and we could really get on the ground and get involved with things. I was able to uh, go out to our local library and I printed out a couple of resources here to make a small material kit. 
I, I found a lot of great things on Night Sky Network. They're a really good resource to go to. Uh, this was from NASA on the right here. This was a guide on finding the planets. So you have something like a planetosphere here, a small sky chart, an all sky chart, and it shows the ecliptic at the bottom where you'll find the planets as well as the Milky Way. So this was primarily intended for the younger audiences, uh, maybe elementary and middle school students coming up in a high school because I'm teaching them to observe with meteor showers and a lot of naked eye things, starting to learn the constellations down here. Uh, the League website had a great planetosphere from RASC. I was able to, print, to order a bunch of these and also have them along with these other guides and, and kind of staple them all together and have something ready to go for people coming into the library for summer events. And then again, an issue very important to many of us, uh, not only young astronomers, is the issue of light pollution. We don't always understand how it impacts us, but uh, Night Sky Network had this really great activity where you have a wheel at the bottom and it has the constellation Scorpius and Orion, depending on what time of year it is. And as you scroll this wheel, it shows what the constellation Scorpius looks like in different light polluted levels. So it shows, it goes on a scale of one to six, not quite like the Bortle scale. On one, it shows just the star in Teres, in, and that would be from, say, something like Times Square, the middle of a city, where the lights are just blocking out all of the stars that you could see, and there really isn't much else to observe other than the brightest stars and planets. But as you go around and as you scroll the wheel along, you can see how more stars come out the uh, farther into the country you go or the farther into less light polluted areas that you go. And as you're doing this, the wheel has all sorts of great information on shielding your lights properly and, and blocking out light pollution and, and doing every step that we can as individuals to, to combat this issue of light pollution and protect our night skies. So like I said, this was for younger audiences and it really is important to let them know that the young skies are the, the, the night sky is something that should be protected and that it's something that all of us share. And again, not only understanding light pollution, but also understanding what there is to see and how valuable that is. I think that's a great lesson to pass along in combating light pollution. So I'd like to conclude with the teen-centered outreach. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, we really do have to go, if we wanna reach out to teenagers, we have to go where they are. They're on social media quite a lot. Uh, that's a lot, that's a lot um, it's a great format that they use to explore um, news, explore events in the world. And that's a lot of where I went to uh, to share my own outreach. And the website was also a great resource too because I could share that through my club meetings. I could share it through Global Star Party and people could go on there and they could see my list of resources um, and they could see Mars Week and all of the different programs that we created. It was a really nice area to centralize everything that we were doing and, and conduct some outreach from there. Now, current events engage people quite a lot too. News is always fascinating to people, especially when it involves space flight. So like I said, the Crew Dragon launch was very exciting. Perseverance landing was exciting. Even some of the later Crew Dragon missions that have flown to the station, they've captured people's imagination quite a lot. So I enjoyed sharing those. And because they were so current and, and they were developing and you could engage with those in the world mm -hmm. and, and see what was going on, those were great to share as well. Now, in conducting this outreach, they, they open us, they, they open opportunities for us to explain things like distance scale and stellar evolution, planetary science. There's all these different kinds of lessons that we can build into our outreach. So if people are observing the Mars uh, opposition, for example, that gives us an opportunity to explain how the planets orbit the sun. And if you're looking at the planet Mars through a telescope, why are the ice caps shrinking? And why do the dark areas expand and contract uh, during periods of dust storms. That's really fun to, to share with a lot of people, I think. And again, we have to go where teenagers are. We have to go on social media. We have to go on websites and we have to engage them with current media and things that are exciting to them. And that is quite a wide variety of subjects uh, depending on who you're talking to. I think there's something for everyone. And it's really important that in reaching out to teenagers, we have something for everybody and we go where they are. So thank you very much. Connell, thank you. Um, you've been a star for us for many months now, and uh, we really appreciate all you've done for uh, both the league and, and working with the RASC as well. I'd like to ask you, did you by any chance see the SLU presentation earlier? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, we had a presentation from Paul Cox with SLU. Uh, remote telescopes in the Canary Islands and a number of other locations, fantastic instruments. And 
they have student memberships there that run about $50 a year. And I think they have also packages for clubs, for example, uh, to access these remote telescopes that might be particularly attractive to young people. Uh, it's something you might want to explore, take a look at SLU, uh, because it was a fascinating presentation. And I, I can just imagine a lot of young people would be very attracted to the what we saw there tonight. And uh, uh, what do you think about using astrophotography as an attractor? Is that something that seems to be a, of great interest to a lot of the young people you're around? That certainly has become a, a great interest to many young people. And I think the reason for that is because it was something that I was able to do myself. It's one thing to share an image from Hubble or an image that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter took, but I think a lot of people have this perception that those are so far out. And I mean, they are quite far out in, in a literal sense of distance, but these are things that are beyond us. It's something only the, the professionals can do, only people with trained degrees. And I'd, I'd like to, to say that, no, actually, you can go out and observe this yourself. So when I'm taking images of star trails or a beautiful shot of the Milky Way in the summer, that's quite a lot like what you're seeing, depending on what the image is, the eclipses of the sun, so in, in posting those and sharing those with people, sharing them in my meetings, I was able to clearly communicate that this was something that I observed and I had the image from it of exactly what I saw. And, and my audience understood that this was something that they could go out and see too. And I think once they understood that it wasn't something so far out that they could see for themselves, that just opened them right up to, to go out and, and observe the night sky or uh, any other type of astronomical observing. Uh, one of our regulars on GSP, Cameron Gillis, you may recall meeting him on one of the Global Star Party, says, you are light years ahead with a great future, and I couldn't agree more. Scott, do you have any questions for him from the audience or any comments? No, I, you know, he's been on Global Star Party many times, and uh, the thing that's so great about Connell is that he just has the, uh, you know, the right enthusiasm, the right vision for uh, you know, exciting a, a new generation of amateur astronomers. Like I, it's genuine, it's real. He's working on it very hard, and uh, um, you know, it's it's hard not to get enthusiastic with him. You know, so you know, uh, thank you, Connell, for all of that work you're doing. Yes, and thank you very much for for the platform of Global Star Party. I couldn't have done it without you. No, oh, you're completely welcome, and uh, always welcome. Thank you very much. Connell, good luck in school. Thank you very much, okay. Chuck. Okay. All right. Take care. Thanks again. You as well. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brian Hayden, are you with us? Yes. There, can you there hear he is. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Uh, Hayden. Yeah. I, I got it correct. Good. I just wanted to make sure. Um, about a month or so ago, I was wandering around YouTube, as all of us do during the pandemic from time to time, and I stumbled on a video about boiling water with gravity by Brian Hayden. And I watched this and was, I marveled at the enthusiasm of these videos. He has a YouTube channel called Alpha Phoenix. And it was a bit worrisome to me as Terry uh, Mann and I were organizing uh, this uh, Alcon virtual convention because we were managing 94 speakers and award donors and uh, recipients rather and uh, door prize donors. And it kept coming to mind what the motto on Alpha Phoenix was, which is that plan A always goes up in flames. And so far, we seem to have gotten through two of the three days without anybody being on fire. So we're, we're lucky so far, Brian. Uh, Brian uh, grew up in Sylvania, Ohio, which I believe is the suburb of Toledo, and got his uh, Bachelor of Science degree in physics from NC State University and his PhD in material science from the University of California at Santa Barbara. And he's now working in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and he is uh, the son of one of our master observers, uh, Jeff Hayden, who I think has an observatory uh, back home. And uh, I cannot emphasize enough how great these Alpha Phoenix videos are. You've got to check them out. They're incredible. And with that, I will turn the program over to Brian. Uh, this will be Hunt for NEOs and Planetary Radar. Thank you. Uh for that introduction. And uh, thanks to, wait, 
am I getting the right screen to share here? There we go. <laughs> and thanks to uh, everybody for you know hanging out until the last session of the night here. Uh, I am from the internet, <laughs> have a YouTube channel, as uh, as Chuck just said, and unfortunately, I could not quite uh, quite crack a hundred before I had to take the screenshot for this talk yesterday. But uh, I have technically been posting videos for, for quite a while. Uh, my first video was probably about eight years ago. And as uh, like Chuck just said, I officially went to school for physics and material science. A lot of my videos have revolved around things like crystal structures and uh, physics experiments and things like that. One of my, one of my favorite projects was recreating uh, Fijot's original speed of light measurement. But also, as a hobby, I've been very into photography. So I've had a bunch of videos about uh, photography and have started to get into the realm of how-to videos for more technical things like time lapses and specifically uh, astro time lapses. And that has generated an overlap with what is the largest probably single theme for videos on my channel, which is space. So I have a bunch of videos about um, astrophotography, a bunch of videos that are just time lapses, uh, videos about rockets and satellites and various ways that we can observe the night sky. So like I said, it started a while ago, channel didn't do a whole lot. Uh, over the last couple of years, I've put a little more effort into it, but a couple months ago, all of a sudden, the uh, YouTube algorithm decided that it wanted to show my videos to everybody, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> and one of those people uh, was Chuck Allen, who said, uh, hey, if you have any astronomy related videos, we'd love to have you come talk. And I said, I have a lot of astronomy related videos. <laughs> and he said that if I could come and talk about asteroids, that would be great. And I thought that that sounded wonderful. So today I'm sort of going to be doing the live version of a couple of videos. Uh, one, looking for asteroids at backyard observatory scale with optical telescopes. And then second one, talking about how big radar telescopes actually can image asteroids, not just as a spec, but as an actual you know, you know, physical shape with surface features. And the fun thing about being able to give these live is that now I get to talk about more stuff that I didn't have time to cram into those videos, all the little interesting tidbits that get cut before, it, uh, before the video sees the light of day. So I am probably preaching to the choir here when I say that space is a violent place. Uh, I saw uh, Dr. Dunham's talk earlier, which was fascinating. And I have a couple of the same justification graphs <laughs> in terms of uh, there, there are very few things that are so violent that we know happen, that we know have happened to our planet in the past that can so easily erase our entire species and everything that we've learned as an asteroid impact. So uh, I don't need to work too hard to convince you of that, but I do want to start with what I think is probably the ideal scenario of, uh, of how we could deal with an asteroid impact in the future from one of my favorite TV shows called The Expanse. It's a sci-fi show that set, I think it's supposed to be like four or 500 years in the future. Their technological jump from us is maybe a little aggressive, but in this case, these two people right here are uh, on the moon. They're in, a, they're in a, uh, a government base on the moon and they know that there is an asteroid headed towards Earth. And this guy just looked at his phone and he said, the watchtowers have a fix. Like they literally have a network of satellite telescopes that are looking everywhere for asteroids or other objects that could be flying towards Earth at all moments. They just have this. And then the, the sort of dubious thing here is that once they know that there's an asteroid that is imminently going to hit Earth, they all sort of crowd around the window on the moon as if they would be able to see, you know, a tens of, of uh, meters across lump of iron from the Earth to moon distance away. <laughs> 
I, I also wanted to complain about how it was daytime here and on Earth, but it's sort of a half moon, so you can believe that. But it's weird that they're looking at the horizon and the Earth shadow is up and down. But aside from that, they're watching this asteroid. And as this asteroid approaches Earth, uh, there is a little flash over here, and they shoot something at this asteroid that basically breaks it up. And then they fire a whole bunch of missiles and explode it. So uh, this is probably a ridiculously non-physical way that you could get rid of an asteroid immediately before it hit Earth. Uh, one of the things that I really wish that they'd shown was the effect that this much iron vapor had when it hit the surface. Because even if you had so much energy as to vaporize an asteroid, like you can't erase that kinetic energy. It's still gonna hit the atmosphere and do something. Uh, but at the very least, this isn't the kind of response we could mount today. So what do they have that we don't? Uh, first of all, they have a moon base where the government lives, but you don't really need that to avoid asteroid impacts on Earth. So we can cross that out. They also have a very robust network of telescopes that are able to locate and track asteroids and predict orbits forwards. Uh, we have some of that, but we don't have anything near the system that they have in place in this example. They also have very rapid launch capability. They have all of these, you know, missiles that can intercept asteroids just ready to go and they can launch them off of Earth in, in no time flat. There are a bunch of companies, especially like small sat launchers that are startups right now that are doing really interesting work in rapid launch capability. But most of these are for very small payloads and still like days of, of uh, notice before launch. So, you know, we're not there yet either. They also demonstrate the math to intercept moving objects in space. This is something that we have. <laughs> there have been a bunch of uh, great missions over the last few years that have actually been able to intercept asteroids and comets that were thankfully very far from Earth. Uh, I'm very excited to see uh, DART go up. I don't know when it's actually supposed to impact, but I think it uh, is supposed to launch very soon or just did. I'm not being in California anymore, I'm sad that I actually am not going to see that take off in Vandenberg. The last item on this list is how they actually uh, intercepted this particular asteroid. They've got these big orbiting railgun stations and uh, really big nukes. Now, I was gonna cross this one off also, and then I did a little bit of math and determined that if you want to vaporize a, a 50 meter sphere of iron, that it actually takes less than a megaton explosion if you had a 100% energy conversion. So this is probably like the most depressing thing that we line up with them on. But <laughs> if we fired that many missiles at an asteroid that close to Earth, we would break it into very small pieces. But again, might you know still do something when it hit the ground. So there are many better options, granted that we can detect something years in advance and try to deflect it rather than destroy it. But the very first step in all of this is just find them. We need to locate all of these asteroids. And the difficulty with that is that there are a lot of asteroids. So this is uh, an image from a JPL article from 2018. Uh, weirdly, the ticker up here says 2020. So I'm assuming they just projected forwards and they didn't actually update this graphic in the old article. But regardless, there are a lot of asteroids here. And over the last two years, there have been a lot more asteroids discovered. So the ability to find all of these and know enough about them and what can perturb their orbits, interactions with other bodies, interactions with the sun and the rotation of the asteroids and the shape of the asteroids and weird ways that physics can perturb these orbits allows us to predict their orbits far into the future and determine whether or not they're going to be hazards. One of my favorite examples of an asteroid finding mission, really just because I love this animation, is the WISE telescope. Now, WISE stands for the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, and it basically was launched to take an infrared map of the entire sky. But after it was done with this map, it was out of coolant and not able to take the really low temperature infrared shots anymore. But they brought it back online for a while to look for asteroids, because if you have a telescope that can look at the entire sky, it can catalog the entire sky in survey mode and look for things that move. And this 
is an animation of it discovering many, many, many asteroids. And this white line here are the newly discovered ones. And it's really cool. You can actually see the plane that it was orbiting in and the plane that the telescope was pointing in. And as that sweeps around, it's discovering more and more objects as the Earth goes around the sun. And all of the green dots here are actually NEOs. So these are objects that have orbits that cross very close to the Earth's orbit. And it looks like it's discovering lots and lots and lots of them here. But this is actually only a tiny fraction of the NEOs uh, <laughs> that have been discovered. I also have this picture here. I wanted to show, because I really like this picture uh, for the technical challenge, but I really wish that I'd thought of it earlier so I was able to get a better picture because I really was only able to make two or three real attempts at getting this shot. But if you squint, there is a tiny little streak right here going this way that is a satellite flare off of WISE uh, next to Comet NEOWISE, which uh, was actually discovered during WISE's uh, rebirth to look for, for asteroids as NEOWISE, which I thought was pretty fun to be able to get those both in the same frame. But like I said, it's not actually that many of the NEOs that we've discovered. It's these, uh, the, the blue sort of teal color here are near Earth objects discovered by NEOWISE and all of the other colors are other projects. Uh, the most, the, the heavy lifters here are the Pan Stars Project and the Catalina Sky Survey based out of, uh, well, observations based out of Hawaii and Arizona. And really this constitutes like five telescopes that are dedicated to this that are finding thousands of new objects every year, which is fantastic. Uh, that said, it feels like we should have more than five telescopes across the globe dedicated to something like this, because it feels pretty important to me. But uh, it's, it's really cool that these programs are able to make such progress. This is, uh, I think, a, a two years updated version of the, uh, of the graph that Dr. Dunham showed earlier, uh, basically saying we still have a lot of asteroids yet to find. Uh, thankfully, the really big asteroids, the, the, the 10 kilometers, the, the multi-kilometer objects, we think we've got them all because they're big enough that they're pretty bright and they're easy to see. But when you get into the, you know, tens of meters of asteroids that can still do a lot of damage, if you notice that this is a log scale, uh, we have a very, very long ways to go in discovering all of these objects and <laughs> being able to make sure that they're not going to run into us. The thing that makes this so difficult is that asteroids viewed from Earth are very, very faint. Uh, this is an asteroid, and if it wasn't perfectly centered in the frame and it wasn't a really close approach to Earth, uh, it would make it almost impossible to discern uh, in this image because it just looks like another star until you actually start it moving. So this is uh, 3122 Florence. And this was actually a sequence of images uh, taken when Florence was making a very close approach to Earth uh, by my dad with this 14-inch uh, RC in a pleasantly dark skies region of uh, rural North Carolina. And this is probably uh, better equipment than the average amateur, but it's <laughs> still backyard scale astronomy. And you can see asteroids like this uh, if you know where to look. And I think that that's really cool. Now, he's not out there discovering new objects. That's what those big survey projects are for. But once those survey projects get a blip that they think might be an asteroid, they plot an approximate orbit and basically publish a note that says, does anybody else see this rock where we see a rock? And a lot of that data aggregation is orchestrated by the Minor Planet Center, which takes in all these discoveries and makes lists of requested observations that professionals and amateurs can respond to and uh, contribute to this effort. So anybody can, can go out to the Minor Planet Center website, type in their location and get an ephemeris for some newly discovered object that may or may not exist and learn where and when to look in the sky to see this possible NEO. And if a whole bunch of people go look for it and they all see it in the same spot, then the Minor Planet Center says, yep, that's an asteroid and they start tracking it. So my dad has a handful of confirmations for new objects 
And on some of those, the ephemeris was actually pretty far from the real position when you go fit the data. So I think it's really cool that he's actually helped to refine some of these orbits as an amateur. And it's, it's, a, it's fantastic that this is possible. But I also think that it's really terrifying that amateurs can play this game. It, again, feels like we should have enough survey scopes posted around the globe uh, doing aster asteroid confirmations and tracking all the time automatically. We have all of the technology necessary to make that happen. And uh, it just doesn't exist yet. Now, the reason that the Minor Planet Center puts this out and that you need so many observations is because it's really difficult to figure out exactly where something is in space when you have relatively limited data to go off of. If you have something like an orbiting telescope that sees an asteroid here, of course, it can only define a direction because you know, you're looking at a spot in angle space. This isn't you know, actual physical coordinates. So you need at least one other observation to figure out where those two observations are gonna cross. And in three dimensions, those observations might not cross. So you need a lot of observations and then you need, ob excuse me, and then you need observations that are separated in time so that you can figure out where an object is and then where the object is a few minutes from now. And then you can figure out what its trajectory is. Once you have enough of these observations that are spread out over time and spread out over the surface of Earth, so you're looking at the asteroid from, from different directions and different points in Earth's orbit, you can combine them and figure out exactly where this asteroid lives right now. Now, this, is, this yellow line here is actually the orbit uh, for Florence as it was approaching Earth when this sequence was taken. And once you know where this asteroid is right now, you don't necessarily know where it's going to be quite a while in the future because there are a lot of things that can affect and apply forces to the orbit of these objects over very long time periods, notably the spin and the interaction with the sun. And uh, I mean, you can predict if they're going to come close to other large bodies like planets that are going to give them a kick, but uh, uh, basically slow adjustments to orbit can be very difficult to track. So if we want to learn more, one of the primary tools is planetary radar. So this is, of course, a picture of uh, Arecibo before it fell. Uh, Arecibo was the largest radar telescope in the world. It had recently been surpassed as the largest radio telescope, but it was our best tool for uh, looking at uh, asteroids planetary radar. And I've got a handful of videos on my channel about astrophotography. And in one of them, I'm lamenting how dim the Milky Way is and saying that you can't actually use a camera flash to take a picture of the Milky Way because it's so far away that you, the light would never come back in time. And once it did, it would be way too dim because it's so far away. But when you're doing planetary radar astronomy, you are literally using a camera flash. You are sending an exorbitantly bright pulse of microwaves into space. Those microwaves are bouncing off of an object like an asteroid and they're returning to the same dish where they can be detected. And then with some very clever image processing, you can actually use them to generate an image that looks like this. So uh, unlike just a speck in the sky that you can see with an optical telescope, planetary radar can give you these fantastically detailed views. So. Uh, these actually are both the same object. I believe that both of these pictures were actually taken on the same night as this asteroid made its close approach to Earth. And if you look at the surface here, there are all sorts of, you know, lumps and craters and detail about what's going on. We can actually see that there are two moons that are orbiting this object. But at the same time, there are a bunch of things about this image that should give you some cause for concern. Uh, it doesn't really look right. First of all, the object is very oblong, it's sort of, you know, oval shaped here. Uh, but as it's rotating, it, that doesn't change. It doesn't actually flip all the way around. And if you follow any particular surface feature, like a crater, as it goes over the front here, it sort of expands as it passes onto the side of the object. And it just looks weird. It's like it's distorting. Another thing you might notice is that the moon's both pass in front of the asteroid in opposite directions. And that's 
not physically impossible uh, in terms of how you could capture things gravitationally, but it's certainly not likely. Uh, and when you count the fact that the asteroid itself appears to be rotating normal to the orbits of both of the moons, that's like, there's really something weird about this image. And it looks like you're seeing an asteroid illuminated by the sun from the side. But that's not what this is. The Earth was actually to the right of the asteroid. And this is a reconstructed image of what it would look like if you were taking a picture straight down on the pole of the asteroid, uh, presumably at about a 90 degree angle to where Earth was. So nobody actually took this picture of the top of the asteroid. And about the time that Arecibo was being closed down and receiving a lot of press, I was trying to research this because I had heard of planetary radar images before, but I didn't really understand how they worked. And I couldn't find a great description online. It, uh, it, it has shocked me over the last uh, handful of years, like in grad school, that a lot of really standard techniques in science just don't appear in textbooks or websites. It's, you need to have find you need to find someone who like has done a technique before to explain it to you in a lot of cases. Now, maybe I'm spoiled in the age of the internet, but I feel like I've been frustrated by this all the time. So I found explanations of this on like Stack Exchange articles. And uh, there was one really good article uh, that was from the Planetary Society, but it was old enough that all of the pictures had been archived. So trying to explain all the geometry and the physics involved in reconstructing an image like this without pictures was pretty difficult. So once I was able to conglomerate enough stuff together, uh, I decided to make a YouTube video about it because at the very least, I, uh, I hope that a future curious version of myself would be able to find an answer more easily uh, than I did. I guess that's, that's uh, the advantage of the internet now is that you can add to it if you can't find uh, something that you think should be there. So radar, at its most basic, uh, just tells you how far away something is. So it originally was an acronym standing for radio detection and ranging. And uh, here we have a man with a radar dish who has fired a bunch of microwave photons at the asteroid Bennu. And once those photons hit the target, they bounce back in all directions, which actually is, is very troubling for a, a range thing because the intensity of these observations dies off as R to the fourth because they scatter at both ends, which is really frustrating. But uh, some of that light will actually make it back. So you have to both emit and detect light. And if you time the round trip, of course, you can figure out how far away it is, as long as you know the speed of light. And in space, that's even easier because there's no mass to get in the way and, and mess up the speed of light. But this is just a distance. This isn't actually a picture of an asteroid. Now, the easiest way to take a picture of sorts using radar, uh, at least get something spatially resolved, is to take a radar dish and spin it around. This is how uh, air traffic control works, or at least probably used to work before everything was all GPS. And if you take a radar dish and you spin it around through 360 degrees, any place that you hear an echo back, if you send a signal and listen and send a signal and listen in all different directions, you will basically generate a plot like this of the distance to the closest thing that can cause a radio echo versus angle. So if you look in you know, some direction, you see a plane, you look in some other direction, you see a rocket, you look in some other direction. If, uh, if Bennu was only you know, three kilometers away, that the other people in uh, air traffic control would probably be too busy looking at you know, the coming apocalypse to make fun of you for plotting your radar signal on Cartesian axes like this, because the vast majority of the time you get radar plotted like this on a polar graph. This is the very stereotypical you know, circular ping as it, as it goes around kind of plot. This is actually a clip from Airplane where they uh, are referring to this as the radar range. And then they follow it up with a joke about a microwave called the radar range, which is startlingly accurate because these actually both operate at the same uh, set of wavelengths in the uh, few gigahertz uh, regime. So I decided to figure out how quickly you could boil water with Arecibo. Now Arecibo was able to operate a one megawatt uh, continuous wave uh, microwave beam. 
So if you know that you're going from room temperature to the boiling point and you know the specific heat of water and you know that you're pumping in a megawatt and you want to boil like a liter of water, then you could boil a liter of water in a third of a second if you focused Arecibo into a water bottle like this. Uh, unfortunately, even when it was operating, you couldn't because that would have been a pretty spectacular demo. But <laughs> Arecibo was able to accomplish this with these massive amplifiers called klystrons that uh, will amplify microwave frequency signals. This is not one from Arecibo, this is from a different facility. But if you think of a vacuum tube, you know, it's like smaller than your hand. I've got some Nixie tubes that are like the size of your thumb, maybe, that display numbers and stuff. There are very few electrical components that, you know, can be put on two by fours and carried around on a pallet. So these are serious devices. And this is one of the things that uh, I, I'm happy that I get to talk about here live because I was very confused at how these worked and I dug into it and I thought it was really interesting, but I couldn't fit an explanation of how these giant vacuum tubes work into a 10 to 15 minute long YouTube video that was already too long. So uh, this is the diagram of a klystron off of Wikipedia. And basically they describe it as a an electron gun that operates at tens of kilovolts and it launches electrons through two different microwave cavities. And if you pump microwaves into the first cavity, uh, bigger microwaves come out of the second cavity. And this is pretty obtuse when you first see it, but uh, especially because the entire microwave signal for a short while is actually being carried by this beam of electrons that's passing between these cavities, just flying through open space with your entire megawatt signal in it. And uh, it's super weird. So as a, uh, as a material scientist, I have probably spent way too many hours with electron microscopes, which means that I'm probably more familiar than I should be with how electron guns work. But that is the first step in uh, how a klystron works. Basically an electron gun consists of a negatively charged needle and a positively charged plate. So in between these two uh, devices, you're going to actually build up an electric field that's going to point from this positive plate back towards the negatively charged needle. And you generate electrons at the tip of that needle where the, where the field is strongest, the smallest radius of curvature. So if you generate an electron right there, it is going to feel an acceleration in the opposite direction as that field, which means that the electron is actually going to be accelerated to the right here. And it would just slam into this positively charged plate. But if you're very careful and you drill a hole in the plate, uh, that electron will actually pass straight through. And now you have an electron that's moving. And once this electron gets suitably far away from this assembly, it sees these positive and negative charges as basically canceling out. So you can think that as soon as this electron is past this wall, it basically feels no force anymore because these things are going to cancel out and it's just, there's neutralness behind it and there's nothing in front of it. So now we have an electron that's moving at a constant speed. Now we can play with it and we can add more plates in the road. So if you put uh, two more charged objects with pinholes in them, the electron can fly through. Again, these charges are the same. So the electron here still feels no force and an electron over here would also feel no force. But for just a moment, while the electron is passing in between these plates, it experiences a very large electric field. And during that time, we can actually affect its speed. So if there's an electron that lives right here, it's actually being attracted to this positively charged plate, which is slowing it down and pulling it this way. And it's being repelled from the negatively charged plate, which is also slowing it down and accelerating it this way, which means that when an electron comes out of those plates, it's going slower than when it went in. Now, uh, imagine that we've done that backwards. So if the next plate was flipped, so we had a negatively charged plate and then a positively charged plate, now as the electron goes through, it actually gains a little bit of speed. So depending on the polarity of those plates, we can make electrons go faster or slower. And once they leave those plates, they continue traveling at the exact same speed, which means that this bottom electron is actually going to overtake this uh, top electron after you know, a minute. 
So now I really need you to bear with me and assume that instead of a set of parallel plates, we're actually sending these electrons into a microwave oven, which is a more accurate depiction uh, than I originally thought that it was when I designed this slide. <laughs> so inside of a microwave oven, there are very strong electric fields. And those electric fields oscillate at gigahertz frequencies. They switch polarity back and forth and back and forth. So now putting an electron through a microwave is basically like putting an electron through a set of parallel plates that are continuously switching back and forth. And that means that sometimes when an electron goes through, it's going to be slowed down. And sometimes when an electron goes through, it's going to be sped up. So you've got like, you're applying alternating speeds to every other electron that goes through the system. So here, I, I have actually done it with every other electron, which makes life a little bit simpler, where half of the electrons have been slowed down and half of the electrons have been sped up as they pass through that first microwave chamber. Now, right after they leave, they are actually still reasonably spread out. They haven't really changed their period at all. But because one set of electrons will overtake the other, after a while, if they're just allowed to keep flying in a straight line, eventually they will bunch up and that you'll, you'll get overlapping electrons here and they're farther apart. Which means that you can take a, uh, a relatively weak signal and if you cut the frequency, excuse me, if you cut the frequency in half, you actually double the amplitude here because now we have two electrons that are bunched up and, they, and the bunches only come half as often. And if you put another microwave here, but you don't turn that microwave on, you can actually get that cavity to resonate and you can extract microwave radiation from that that has been significantly amplified and pump that into a radio telescope and shoot it in space. So looking at this diagram again, uh, some of these labels hopefully make a little bit more sense. We still have the electron gun over here. And then the first microwave cavity is called the buncher cavity. So it just applies little kicks that slow down some of the electrons and speed up some of the electrons. And then as that beam flies through open space, the electrons actually form clumps and they make a microwave signal at half the frequency and much uh, uh, higher power. And then they are received in another cavity called the catcher that actually will resonate and then you can extract your signal from that. And when you extract your signal from that and you uh, fire that into a large parabolic dish and you aim it into space, you can image an asteroid. But it's not quite that simple because if you try to take the air traffic control approach to radar imaging and you just want to raster a beam across an asteroid, theoretically, uh, you could try to do this. And you know, you, you get a different radar reflectivity from every spot on the asteroid and you could raster it back and forth and you could generate an image. Uh, unfortunately, the beam is not actually this focused. So the, uh, the orbital distances here are, are not, <laughs> not to scale, but the size of the Earth and the Moon and the width of the beam are to scale. So this is as focused as Arecibo can get. And at its minimum imaging distance, uh, because of stuff that had to move around in the Gregorian dome, it would send signals and then it had to rearrange itself before it could receive signals. Uh, it had a minimum distance that it could image. And at that minimum distance, it, the beam diameter was 450 kilometers. So uh, there's no object uh, that you really want to image that is going to be 450 kilometers in diameter uh, right here. So your beam is basically going to be approaching the asteroid as a, as a plane wave. It hits the whole asteroid at once. And unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about it. So you can't raster back and forth and try to draw a map like that. When this beam hits the asteroid, this one keeps going say that this beam reflected off the tip here, then you have the reflected beam, the echo coming back, which again, by the time it gets to Earth, basically is all coming in parallel. And then that is going to uh, land in your receiver. And you say, yes, I got a packet of light. 
And if you time that round trip, again, you can figure out how far away the asteroid is, but that's not an image. In order to pull an image out of that single clump of data that came back, uh, we need to know some more things. We need to know time resolved information, and we also need frequency resolved information. Because the other thing that you can do with radar that I haven't talked about yet is look at the Doppler shift. So everybody's pretty familiar with Doppler shift because uh, it's how the police give you speeding tickets. In this case, uh, car is going towards this guy with who's shooting a radar gun towards them, all of the radar echoes coming back are going to be blue shifted. And if they're blue enough, then, uh, then he's going to give you a ticket, which would, would not be a good thing. But if you want to do the same thing with an asteroid, you can look at the blue shift from the asteroid if the asteroid is moving towards Earth. And if the asteroid is moving away from Earth, these signals will actually be slightly red shifted as they return. And if you combine these things together, now we can basically get a heading using an optical image, and then you can tell the distance to the object using radar time of flight, and you can tell the relative speed, really the component of the, of the asteroid speed in the direction of Earth using a uh, Doppler shift. So this is fantastic for trying to plot the, the trajectory of an asteroid, but it's still not actually a picture. So we need to be able to take the clump of returning information and resolve it into an image. And to do that, we have to stop treating the asteroid as a point mass out in space where all of the light is reflected from the same spot. As a physics major, it kills me to not treat an asteroid like a point mass. Uh, but in one more slide, we're going to assume that it's a sphere, which is like the next best thing to a point mass. So that still makes me happy. Now, in this particular case, if this beam of radiation hits uh, the asteroid here, then the first place that that beam can impact is the very front edge of the asteroid, because that is the closest part of the asteroid to Earth, which means that this first band of returning radiation we know hit this part of the asteroid. And this last band of returning information we know hit as far back on the asteroid as there is a reflectable surface. So probably somewhere around the, the midpoint, going from the front of the asteroid to the back. And any single pulse that we send in towards the asteroid is going to come back spread out by the width of that asteroid, which means that we can actually analyze this signal over time and draw a reconstruction of what this asteroid might have looked like. If we assume that the asteroid is roughly round and a nice convex shape, with this signal, you can tell that the front of the asteroid has to be a lot brighter than the sides of the asteroid after you correct for surface area and things like that. So in this case, we get basically a, a spot on the front. It ends up looking like a buckeye. But uh, you could imagine with a much more complicated signal, you could draw you know, a bullseye pattern on the front of your asteroid because you know that it's brighter and then dimmer and then brighter and then dimmer and then brighter just because of the time of flight. Part of that asteroid was farther away than another part of that asteroid. Unfortunately, a sphere with a bullseye on it is also not a complete picture of an asteroid. It's basically one dimensional data. And to make an image, we need two dimensional data. So for that, we turn to the Doppler effect. And for the Doppler effect, we have to remember that relative to Earth, at the very least, every asteroid to some degree is spinning. So if this uh, asteroid was turning in a circle this way, and I know that this is a picture of Bennu, I picked it because it was a nicely convex asteroid that we have good pictures of. And uh, this is actually the equator, but I needed to make it an animation for YouTube, so I spun it the other way around. <laughs> and if this uh, incoming wave bounces off of the edge that in the animation here is approaching Earth, then that returning light is actually going to be slightly blue shifted. And if that uh, incoming radiation bounces off of the bottom here that is getting farther away from Earth, it's going to come back slightly red shifted. And you can actually plot all different distances uh, from the top to the bottom here, or 
from the, the east to the west on, on, a, uh, on an asteroid because we're basically looking down the rotating pole. And you can say if it's significantly blue shifted or if it's significantly red shifted or if it's somewhere in between, you can draw a gradient here. And again, you can determine where different elements of that returning packet of light came from on the asteroid. So if you decompose your time varying signal into a red component and a blue component, you basically can say that half of the asteroid is brighter and half of the asteroid is dimmer because you know that half of it is moving towards you and half of it's moving away from you. And if you split it into a lot of components, then you can draw a much more detailed diagram and you can draw stripes on the asteroid this way. The interesting uh, quirk here is that when you use this mechanism to draw the asteroid, you are always going to draw a picture that's looking down at the rotational pole of the asteroid in question, just because the assumption that you make when you're reconstructing it is that all of the stuff coming towards you is on one side and all the stuff going away from you is on the other side. And the only way that that works is if you're looking down the pole. And that's how you can attempt to, to recreate some of these pictures. So the, the real answer here is that this isn't a picture of an asteroid. It is sort of a frequency spectrum plotted over time of the asteroid. And because of the way that asteroids spin and because of the way that asteroids are shaped, it ends up looking like a picture of an asteroid. But basically, you're just plotting you know, this set of peaks in your time varying and uh, frequency distributed signal here. And it ends up looking like the edge of an asteroid as though it were lit from the direction of the observer, except the front is just stuff that's closer to you and the back is stuff that's farther from you. And the top and bottom are basically things that are moving towards you and away from you, which means that every single time that you take a picture this way, you're looking at it down from the rotational pole. It's not an image in, in real space. <laughs> this is also why I used Bennu as an example earlier, because it's a lot easier to explain this when you look at something that's already mostly a sphere. But it doesn't actually have to mostly be a sphere. These are a bunch of, of uh, radar images taken of asteroids. And if you look at ones like this, there are multiple lobes. Or if you look at this one, there are actually two objects. And if you try to look at any of these with an optical telescope, you just see a single speck of light. So the fact that even though it's not a real picture, you can learn so much about these objects when you reconstruct this frequency diagram in this way. And if you're really careful about it, you can actually use that frequency diagram that's in hertz versus seconds space and you can convert that into an actual 3D model of an asteroid. But you're going to have uh, one really important problem uh, that you'll have to deal with. So this point, this orange point that I have flagged here is a very particular distance from Earth. So the time delay is fixed and it has a very particular speed resolved along the direction towards Earth, which gives it a, a, a particular spot in this image. So you've got two axes, you can draw a pixel right there. There is no other pixel in this image that corresponds to that point in particular. However, uh, that pixel actually corresponds to this point and this point. So this is the problem known as north-south ambiguity. And basically across the, the, uh, the equator of an asteroid, both of these points are precisely the same distance from Earth, and both of these points are precisely the same, or have precisely the same speed component away from Earth. And they may not actually be run one right on top of each other. This one might be, you know, shifted down or shifted up or something like that. We don't know because we don't know what the difference in shape is between the top and bottom, because this image is actually giving us a superposition of them both. So all of these images are not actually what you would see. If you could take a picture at a right angle looking down on a rotating asteroid, they are what you would see if you took a picture above and below an asteroid and then stuffed them together. 
if you were to do this on Earth, you would generate a map like this. And you'd say, oh, yeah, Antarctica is right here next to Canada. And it would be very confusing. So uh, when analyzing asteroids, uh, this is uh, an important distinction that you can't get all of the information using this technique. If you want to start to separate north and south, uh, you have to use much more complicated methods. Uh, the, the occultation examples earlier were really fascinating. That's a great way because that's actually a, a silhouette in real space. I thought that was fascinating. So once your objects get big enough that you're trying to image with radar telescopes, uh, this actually becomes less of a problem. So these are radar maps of Venus. And these are projections as though they were real pictures. It's, it's really great when you're imaging something as spherical as a planet with this technique because the reconstruction can be spot on because you don't need to worry about there being lumps on something the size of a planet. Uh, however, there's a, there's a missing bit in the middle here. So you can't, uh, Venus is so large, it's possible to actually focus a radar beam so that it only hits the northern hemisphere and or only hits the southern hemisphere, or at least is selective enough that you can do some image process or some signal processing and, and differentiate north from south. But right near the equator, you actually can't because these are so close to each other. This is basically the width of the beam or, or your, your resolution limit of your radar beam that you're shooting towards Venus here. And it's, uh, it's sort of entertaining that it leaves gaps in all of these maps. Of course, now we have orbiters that can uh, map planets like that and uh, it's different, but still it's an interesting quirk of this technique that is somewhat limiting, but even for small objects where this is a problem, it still gives us extremely useful information. So overall, uh, once we figure out where an asteroid is, that is conglomerated into sources that can provide uh, an ephemeris. And you can know exactly where and when in the sky to point to find something like an asteroid. And once you know exactly where to point, you can generate an extremely large pulse of microwave radiation. And then you can shoot that pulse of, you can shoot that pulse of microwave radiation uh, towards the target in question. When that light comes back from the target, it's going to be spread out both in time and in frequency space. And if you plot that against time and frequency, against all odds, it actually ends up looking like a photograph. Uh, and then if you take a series of those, you can actually plot surface features all the way around an object and you can get a fascinating spinning image like this and learn a lot about these objects. And hopefully learn things about uh, how they are made and how they may behave, uh, what things may perturb their orbits and what we need to do in order to predict, in, in order to predict where they're going to go. Now, uh, on the first, uh, in, the, in the first section where I was talking about trying to find asteroids optically, the eagle-eyed viewer may have noticed that uh, Florence here was actually listed as a Goldstone radio or a Goldstone radar target on this ephemeris from the Minor Planet Center. So even though Arecibo has now fallen uh, and doesn't look like it's going to be directly replaced anytime soon, uh, there are still radar telescopes all over the place uh, doing really fascinating work. And with that, I will take any questions. And what, with Arecibo gone, what, uh, how extensive a system of radio telescopes of what size would be necessary to provide adequate protection, in your view? I'm not sure that I, I think that the most important thing for overall protection is just optical studies to be able to see as many and catalog as many as possible. Uh, radar measurements certainly help to refine orbits, but I think that the most important information that we can gain from radar telescopes are things like spin and shape and trying to characterize things like the, the Yakovsky effect and how the local dynamics of an asteroid are going to affect its long-term orbit. 
Uh, so there are facilities that can still do that kind of research today. It's just, you know, the, the, the intensity of these dies off as uh, R to the fourth. <laughs> yeah. Very, you need a powerful signal to be able to look into space uh, as far as some of these objects. And I mean, a lot of these, these best images, uh, I, I'm sure were very close approaches to Earth when they tried to do this to get as, mo as much signal as possible. So uh, the, the more powerful telescope you build, the, or the, the more powerful emitter you build and the bigger dish that you build to get the uh, reflection, the, the farther away you can look and the more objects that you can observe and learn about without having to wait for them to get really close to you. <laughs> what, what did you do for your PhD thesis? Uh, I was uh, in a, uh, a semiconductor growth uh, lab. So we actually grew thin films of a material called lead selenide on uh, gallium arsenide and indium arsenide wafers. And lead selenide is a, uh, a very narrow band gap material. So it's useful for infrared optoelectronics, uh, doing things like uh, spectroscopy in the, in the mid infrared, where you can start to look at things like um, vibrational modes, stuff like that. But all of, all of my work was, was not that applied in like making devices that can do spectroscopy, but it was, can we synthesize this material? <laughs> it was much earlier in the process. Yeah, and what are you doing now? Uh, I am actually still doing crystal growth. Uh, I now work at uh, Cree, uh, probably most known for uh, LEDs but uh, now doing um, power electronics. So all of, the, all of the MOSFETs that go into uh, electric cars and whatnot and, do, and drive large electrical loads are uh, likely made of silicon carbide. <laughs> uh, Scott, any comments coming in or any questions? Yeah, there's, there's comments. I mean, people are fascinated and subscribing to your page, Brian. So. <laughs> So they, they need they need to learn more, um, and uh, you're you're one of the guys that can uh, help them get there. So I hope thank so. you. <laughs> Approximately how small an asteroid can you study is one question that came in. Hmm. Uh, I don't know what the actual limit is, but the limit will be set by your ability to resolve time and the the rotational speed of the asteroid. So. If the, if the edges of the asteroid are, there, we'll get a picture. Yeah, so if the asteroid is so short this way that you can't actually measure a time delay before the front of the beam hits the, or I'm sorry, before the beam hits the front of the asteroid and then the beam hits the back of the asteroid, uh, then your mm -hmm. ability to measure in time is going to limit how deep of an asteroid you can look at. I see. And if the asteroid is rotating very, very slowly, then you're going to need a really difficult to separate into all of its components here to do the signal analysis to figure out how far out this is. Because you're, this is not, this is not a, a measurement in meters here. We can only convert this to a distance. This Doppler shift is converted to a distance because we assume that the asteroid is round and we assume that the asteroid is spinning. And uh, actually, this particular um, image of uh, 3122 Florence is an entire rotation of the object. So if you track one of the, you can you can do that with light curves optically. But if you track one of these objects with uh, radar and you see an entire revolution, then you actually can figure out how big it is and you can start to set a scale to these things because you know that speed. <laughs> I see you've discovered uh, Richard God and Bob Vanderby's most accurate flat map of the Earth. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Wait a uh, Richard, uh, the the map, the round map of the Earth that you show, the looks like a polar projection. Yeah, yeah, that oh, is a, a new cartographic wonder created by uh, my friend Richard God and his friend Bob Vanderby. It's the most accurate map ever created. Um, you can stretch a line. It's, it's just two sides of a disk. Um, and uh, 
there's a new paper out about that. I, I was just wondering if you had seen that. Hmm. But uh, anyway, uh, I would like to say, uh, Brian, first of all, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks, Brian. Uh, and let me tell everyone here, if you have not seen Alpha Phoenix videos, you are missing something. Um, this guy knows how to produce a video. I don't know where he learned it, but he's, he's great at it. And uh, they're entertaining and humorous in spots and, um, and cover a wide variety of uh, terrain. I don't know how you're going to continue your surfing in Raleigh, North Carolina, though. That is uh, unfortunate, yeah. <laughs> Myrtle, Myrtle Beach isn't that far away. Okay. <laughs> Brian, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we'll stay in touch with you. Take care. Okay, Terry, I think we have some uh, we have some door prizes to give out. Yes, we do. And this one, I believe, is your donation to the effort. Okay. And you want to describe what it is? It is an Explore Scientific two hundred dollar. I think it's two hundred and fifty dollar. Uh, gift certificate. Uh, it is. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, that's Thank okay. You. So $250 gift certificate from Explore Scientific. Okay. And we will go to our generator and generate number 382. Okay. Let me see if I can get that here quickly. Oh, I got lucky. <laughs> Let's see. Three, two. If that means you won the prize, that, that, won't, work. <laughs> that, that won't work. <laughs> I can't get that lucky, unfortunately. <laughs> we have rules. Okay. Yes, we do. The winner is Steve Adkins. Okay. Congratulations, Steve. Got some nice products coming your way. Okay. Is Douglas Smith with us? I'm here. Okay. Uh, there you are. We're going to go ahead and draw a number for your prize. Would you describe what it is first? Um, it is a, let me turn on a light so I can read my writing. And Douglas, is, by the way, is with the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. Correct. So this is an Explore Scientific 82 degree series eyepiece, 14 millimeter focal length. Argon purged. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll go ahead and draw the number before we ask you to talk about your club for a moment. Uh, you will send me an email with all the address and information. Oh, right. absolutely, absolutely. Okay. You will. You will get a, even a letter with which to transmit the prize. Okay. Okay, and the number will be one three seven, Terry. Thank you. Okay. Um, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little about what your club's up to? Uh, can, can I do a share screen? You here? certainly can. All right. Let's see if this works. There. Um, so, Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association, um, founded in 1954. It's a really big astronomy club. We have over 500 members, including members from other countries. Uh, the members range from rookies to advanced amateurs who have very sophisticated remote observatories. Um, we're lucky to be in Tucson, um, where we get over 300 clear nights a year with low humidity and low light uh, pollution conditions. So we have ideal viewing conditions for a large part of the year. Um, as a result of that, we have a large number of professional observatories in the area. And so the city of Tucson and the surrounding counties actually have very strong zoning requirements for light pollution keeping it to a minimum to preserve the dark skies, which is something I don't see in very many other cities. Um, Tucson is often called Astronomy Central because uh, it's probably the largest concentration of professional observatories uh, in the world. With, there's, there's more than 100 professional telescopes, professional observatories within a 100 mile radius. The list includes Kitt Peak, Mount Graham, which is the home of the large binocular, the Whipple Observatory on Mount Hopkins, the Stewart Observatory on Mount Lemmon, and I can go on, but that's a 
nice list of uh, observatories. University of Arizona has their own mirror lab. A lot of the mirrors now for large telescopes come out of the University of Arizona's mirror lab here in Tucson. Um, the TAAA, as we call it, we do our general meetings the first Friday of each month at the Stewart Observatory Lecture Hall on the U of A campus in Tucson. Um, because we have so many professional observatories nearby and we have the headquarters for the National Optical Astronomy Observatory, also here in Tucson. Many of our guest speakers are often professional astronomers who are performing leader, leading research in the field. Um, TAAA performs a number of outreach activities, many, many star parties. Um, probably the most famous one that we uh, sponsor is the Grand Canyon Star Party held every year in the spring. Participants come from all over the world for uh, not only the great skies, but the great scenery of the Grand Canyon. Um, we've got our, a star party coming up just in a week, actually. It's going to be a virtual star party for obvious reasons. We'll have some telescopes doing live streaming events. Um, you can check it out on our webpage or on our Facebook page. Um, TAAA, we, we have two special dark sky sites that are dedicated uh, dark sky sites. Um, one of them is located about 15 miles west of Tucson um, called Timpa. It sounds like it's close to Tucson and it is, but we've got a mountain range between Tucson and the dark sky site. So it actually works pretty well. And then our, our best dark sky site is one called CAC, which we've got, it's in the Chiricahua Mountains. It's about 90 miles to the Southeast. And uh, the land is owned by TAAA members and was donated to the club. Most of the land around the dark sky site is owned by other astronomers. That whole area is specifically zoned for astronomy. So there's all kinds of light standards about what you can put on your house and so on. Um, facilities out there, we've got a 40 inch dob, we've got a nine inch folded reflector, refractor, sorry. and numerous mid-size telescopes. There are pads for the general public to use. There are also pads that are leased by members. Um, if you look at this image, you can see um, off to the left, the white building off to the left is the 40 inch dob. Uh, you can see some of the pads there and some of the other uh, telescope structures. We are currently building a um, educational center uh, and a, a dormitory for people who want to stay overnight and then sleep. Um, and you can see off to the back behind the 40 inch dob structure, you can see the construction going on back there. That's for the dormitory and uh, uh, learning center. Um, and uh, this is just, so future plans, this is what the CAC site will look like eventually. Um, lots of pads. There, this area down here on the bottom is actually going to be what we call member observatories. That, those will be roll-off shed type observatories where um, we will, TAAA will own the pad and the building, but individual members can lease it and put their own equipment in there and we'll supply them with whatever they need to do Wi-Fi and, and uh, anything else. Um, so if anybody is interested in leasing those things, you can contact us and we'll talk to you about it. But um, yeah, so that's most of what our club is about. Um, I guess that's about it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. And Terry, who do we have as a winner? Kevin O'Neill. Okay, Kevin, congratulations. And thank you, Doug. Appreciate your your contribution and your club's contribution. Really, really great. Next we have is Mark Simonson here. I thought I saw him, Mark. He was here just a moment ago. Yeah, he's there. He's muted. Mark, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. There you are. Okay. Let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. Okay, let us draw the number first. Can we do that? Okay. Yeah. Terry needs time to look it up and I will, uh, hang on just a moment. 
Well, first of all, can you describe the uh, the door prize? Uh, sure, it's uh, a Bader 36 millimeter eyepiece and a laser collimator. Okay, I believe the total value of that is $265. Yes. And I'm going to go to the random number generator. <clears throat> number 416, Terry. Thank you. Okay. All right, Mark, take it away. Okay. Now, if I can find this. <laughs> Everybody see that? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. My name is Mark Simonson. I'm with I'm the uh, astronomical league coordinator for the uh, Everett uh, Astronomical Society, and uh, Everett's a small town in Snohomish County. Well, not so much a small town, medium sized town in Snohomish County, nestled between the uh, the Cascade Mountains and Puget Sound. And uh, currently, our president is Mark Volkert. Vice president is Ron Mosher. The uh, club was started or founded in 1980. We're a small group. We have about 45 members, uh, completely centered around outreach. Uh, we have monthly star parties, if weather permits. Anybody that's been up in Washington, especially Western Washington, knows what I mean by that. Um, our, our star parties are usually out by Panther Lake. One of our members, uh, they have them right there on their property. And we do outreach events for uh, schools, state, and county parks uh, throughout the year. That's all I have. Sorry. Okay. If you'll uh, close your screen share. And Terry, uh, who do we have as a winner of the Martin uh, Eastburn? Okay. Martin, congratulations. And Mark, thank you so much. Uh, I know you've been involved with two clubs that have given door prizes, including yourself, and we really appreciate all that you do and your club. Thanks. Yes, thank you. I appreciate what you all are doing. Thank and you. Terry, why don't you close out by telling everyone about the speaker we have first thing tomorrow at three o'clock Eastern time. Our first speaker tonight, tomorrow will be Dr. Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Um, we are all very familiar with who she is. I don't really want to go through reading no. her bio, but definitely join us for that. That will, I am looking so forward to that talk, and I'm sure everybody else will be too. Um, and that we have Dr. Caitlin Ahrens from uh, NASA Goddard. We have Dr. Larry Crumpler from the Mars Perseverance Ingenuity uh, Geology team. And we have Kelly Beattie talking about dark skies and Dr. Chris Gaynor from the RASC. And I would like to add, there's been numerous questions about listing the winners of the door prizes. I will send that to Scott by tomorrow morning. And that will be all the door prize winners from the beginning to right now. And maybe we can add them one by one tomorrow until we get towards the end. And then they will be on our website, I imagine. So we have a big day coming on tomorrow. I'd like to show you this little card deck. I don't know if you can see it. It's called Legends of Science. Probably can't, it's too much no. light. Yeah. <laughs> It's called Legends of Science, and there are 25 cards here. It was created by a scientist. And there are, I think, 10 legends of the past and 15 present day scientists listed here. Uh, a couple of them you've heard of, Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, Albert Einstein, Euclid, among the legends of the past. And one of the cards is Jocelyn Bell. And that's who we have tomorrow. So please join us. Yes, it'll be an exciting day and our final day too. That's all I have. That's all I've got. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. They, thank you, uh, everybody. We'll, we'll finish with a bang tomorrow. So that's, that's really awesome. <laughs> yeah, thank yeah. everybody. And thanks to all of our clubs too. And Scott, thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Yeah. Congratulations, yeah. Scott. All right. Truly. Thank you. Well deserved. Yeah. Uh, well, it's been a lot, a lot of uh, excitement over the last couple of days here with the uh, Alcon, you know, 2021 Alcon event. Uh, I think, uh, you know, hearing about it come together over all these months and then to actually see it happen and then listen to these amazing speakers. Uh, it's just really exciting and rewarding and you can say you were there. So um, we will uh, we'll resume this at 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central. And uh, what would that be? I think noon in Pacific time. So, and wherever else you are, uh, we hope that you join us uh, we really enjoy the worldwide audience that's watched Alcon, and um, uh, we hope that uh, you come back tomorrow and uh, see some of these really, truly amazing speakers. Good night, and keep looking up. Thank Bye, you. Everyone.